from the instructional television studios of the Archdiocese of New York, Fordham University Campus Ministries presents a National College Satellite TV Retreat. Today's program, A Rediscovery of Life, is conducted by Father Anthony DeMello of the Society of Jesus. And now to introduce Father DeMello is Fordham University's Associate Director of Campus Ministries, Father J. Francis Stroud of the Society of Jesus. Father Stroud. Our program today is being produced by the Campus Ministries of Fordham University with the cooperation of the Catholic Campus Ministry Association and originating from the instructional television studios of the New York Archdiocese. For my introduction of Father Tony DeMello, I have just one personal note I want to communicate with you. The most important year in my life was three years ago when I spent six months with Tony in India. It is a joy for me to share him with you for this one day. Please welcome a colleague, fellow Jesuit, friend, Tony DeMello of the Society of Jesus. Thank you. <laughs> Well, let me begin by telling you what I plan to do with you today. First of all, I'm delighted to be talking to a, a young group. The first time I'm doing this in the United States, I mean, I can see all of you are very young, even the somewhat older looking ones. But <laughs> you know, I plan to keep this as relaxed and as homely as possible. Uh, someone has told you I think this is going to be a retreat. Well, I, yes, a retreat of sorts. You know, your, uh, this isn't a church where I think this is going to be more in the nature of a kind of a dialogue. I discovered something 10, 12 years ago <clears throat> and it turned my life upside down, revolutionized my life. Uh, I became a new man. So this is what I'm going to share with you. Uh, happy to share it with you. Uh, in a special kind of way though, because you might say to me, how come you heard this just 10 or 12 years ago? Hadn't you read the Gospels? <laughs> of course I'd read the Gospels, but I hadn't seen it. It was right there, but I hadn't seen it. Later, having discovered it, see, I found it in all the major religious writings. And I'm amazed. I mean, I, I was reading it, and I hadn't recognized it, hadn't seen it. I wish to God I'd found this when I was younger, like most of you. Oh, what a difference it would have made. So how long would it take to give it to you? A whole day? Well, I'll be honest with you, a couple of minutes. <laughs> I don't think it would take more than two minutes. Giving it to you wouldn't take more than a couple of minutes, I don't think. Grasping it or getting it might take you 20 years, 15 years, 10 years, 10 minutes, one day, three days. Who knows? Who knows? That depends on you. Uh, if you would bring one quality to this uh, little session we're having here together today, just one, you need one quality to see what I sort of saw 10 years ago and what revolutionized my life. Uh, various people have told me hence, uh, since then that their lives were pretty much revolutionized too. Uh, but not too many people, I'm sorry to say, very few. Uh, I tend to think that if about, let's say, 1,000 people are listening to me and one hears it, that's a pretty good average, pretty good average. Is it difficult to hear? Is it difficult to understand? It's so simple, a seven-year-old child could understand it. 
Isn't that amazing? And in fact, when I, I, I think of it today, I think, why didn't I see it? I don't know. I don't know why I didn't see it, but I didn't. Now, maybe one or other of you might see it today or might see part of it. What would you need to see it? Just one thing, the ability to listen. That's all. Are you able to listen? If you can, you might get it. Now, listening is not as easy as you might think it is. Reason. We're always listening from kind of fixed concepts, fixed positions, prejudices. See, listening does not mean swallowing. That's gullibility. Oh, he says it, so I take it. Uh, I don't want any of you to have any spirit of faith while you're listening to me. I mean, you could take what the church te te teaches on faith. You could take the Bible on faith, etc. Don't take me on faith. What I want you to do is question everything I'm saying. Uh, think about it. Come back at me. Feel free to do that. See, even while I'm talking, ask questions, raise your hands anytime. I'd be happy to do this kind of dialogue with you. So it does not mean gullibility. But then listening doesn't mean attacking, see. Because I'm going to say something so new, some of you are going to think I'm crazy. I'm out of my mind. <laughs> so then you're going to be tempted to attack. If you tell a Marxist there's something wrong with Marxism, the first thing he's likely to do is attack you. You tell a capitalist there's something wrong with capitalism, he's up in arms. You tell an American, hey, you know, there's something wrong with the United States. Or... And the same with the Indian, if you're attacking India, etc doesn't mean swallowing, doesn't mean attacking, doesn't mean agreeing. They tell me about a Jesuit superior who was a great success, see. So somebody said to him, how come you're such a great success as a superior? He says, very simple. The formula is simple. I agree with everyone. <laughs> I just agree with everyone. They said, don't be absurd. How could you be a successful superior agreeing with everybody? He says, that's right. How could I be a successful superior <laughs> agreeing with everybody? <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't mean agreeing with me. You could disagree with me and get it. Isn't that amazing? It means being, a, it means being alert. You're alert, you're watching, you're listening with a kind of a fresh mind. That's not easy either. Listening with a fresh mind without prejudices, without fixed formulas. See, like, <laughs> just yesterday somebody told me the story of the guy who was told that, you know, the famous saying, you have an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Well, this guy was having an affair with the doctor's wife and was eating an apple a day. So, uh, <laughs> no, he got it all wrong. He got it all wrong. He was uh, from a fixed formula, see, a fixed position. They tell me to have a priest who was sort of a... Uh, trying to convince an alcoholic parishioner that he ought to give up drink. So he gets a glass of alcohol, pure alcohol, and he gets hold of a bug, a worm, and he drops it into the glass. And the poor worm begins to wriggle. In case where father wasn't listening either, because they tell of the alcoholic who goes to the parish priest. The parish priest was reading the newspaper, didn't want to be disturbed. He said, excuse me, father father was irritated. He ignored him. Uh, excuse me, father. Father says, what is it? He said, could you tell me what causes uh, arthritis, father? Father was irritated. What causes arthritis? He says, drinking causes arthritis. That's what causes arthritis. Going about with loose women causes arthritis. That's what causes arthritis. Gambling causes arthritis. That's what causes arthritis. Why did you ask? He says, because it says in the paper here that the Holy Father has arthritis. <laughs> Father wasn't listening, see? So, okay. All right. If you are ready to hear something new, simple, new, unexpected, against almost everything you've been told till now, ready to hear that? 
then maybe you'll hear what I have to say. Maybe you'll get it. You know, when Jesus taught the good news, I think he was attacked not only because what he taught was good, but because it was new. We hate anything new. I hated anything new. I don't want to hear anything new. Give me the old stuff. We don't like the new. It's too disturbing. Too liberating. Okay. <clears throat> so the ability to listen. Buddha formulated it beautifully. He says, monks and scholars must accept my words not out of respect must not accept my words out of respect, but must analyze them the way a goldsmith analyzes gold by cutting, scraping, rubbing, melting. You must not accept my words out of respect, but analyze them by cutting the way the goldsmith analyzes gold, see? Cutting, scraping, rubbing, melting. Okay, so we've got that clear. Next, the theme of today, we said the rediscovery of life. So let's begin the investigation. Let's begin the research. And then I'll get you even to talk to one another and share views, etc. Okay, so let's start. Life. What's this thing we call life? Take a look at the world and then we, I'll invite you to take a look at your own life. Take a look at the world. Poverty everywhere. I read in the New York Times yesterday that the bishops of the United States claim that there are 33 million people in the United States who are living below the poverty line drawn by the government itself. If you think that is poverty, you ought to come to other countries and see the squalor, the dirt, the misery. You call that life? Well, I've got news for you. I'll show you life even there. Uh, about 12 years ago, a little more, I was introduced to a rickshaw puller in Calcutta. You know what a rickshaw is? The guy who, it's awful. I mean, a human being, you don't have a horse pulling you, but you've got a human being pulling you. The lifespan of these poor men is uh, from 10 to 12 years, once they begin pulling the rickshaw. They don't last very long. They get tuberculosis. See? Now, Ramchandra, Ramchandra was his name. Ramchandra had uh, TB. Uh, at that time, there was a little group of people engaging in an Ill illegal activity called exporting skeletons. The government eventually caught on to them. But uh, you know what they did? They sort of bought your skeleton while you were alive. If you were very poor, you went to them and you sold your skeleton for the equivalent of about $10. And so they'd say to you, many of these rickshaw pullers, they'd say, how long have you been working in this trade? And Ramchandra says, uh, 10 years. And they think, he doesn't have much longer to live. All right, here's your money. Then the moment you die, they, they, they pounce on the body, they take it away. And then when the body is decomposed through some process they have, they get hold of the skeleton. Well, Ramchandra had sold his skeleton. That's how miserable he was. And so on and on. He had a wife. He had kids. And the squalor, the poverty, the misery, the uncertainty. You'd never think to find happiness there, right? <laughs> One day I said to this guy, nothing seemed to face him. He was all right. Nothing seemed to upset him. I said to him, aren't you upset? He said, about what? You know, the, your future, the future of the kids. He, he says, well, I'm doing the best I can, but the rest is in the hands of God. I said, hey, but what about the, your sickness? That causes suffering, doesn't it? He says, a bit. We've got to take life as it comes. I never once saw him in a bad mood. Well, one day when I was talking to this guy, I suddenly realized I was in the presence of a mystic. I suddenly realized I was in the presence of life. It was right there. He was alive. I was dead. 
you know, a, a person, a man who reincarnated in himself, those lovely words of Jesus, look at the birds of the air, look at the flowers of the field, they don't sow, they don't spin, they don't have a moment of anxiety for the future, not like you, it was right here. I know he must be dead by now, you know, I met him very briefly there in Calcutta and then went on uh, <clears throat> to where I live now, further south in India. What happened to this guy, I don't know. But I know I'd met a mystic, extraordinary person. He discovered life, rediscovered, discovered. Uh, you know, it's interesting, I frequently reflected the human mind is such an extraordinary thing. It has invented uh, the computer. It has split the atom. It sends ships into space. It has not solved the problem of human suffering, of anguish, loneliness, emptiness despair. You're pretty young, most of you. But I honestly don't think you're strangers to loneliness, heartache, emptiness, depression, despair. How come we haven't found the answer to that? We've made all kinds of technological advances. Has that raised the quality of our living by one inch? Want to know my opinion? No. Not one inch. Oh, we have more comfort, more speed, pleasures, entertainments, that's right, more erudition greater technological advances. What I'm saying is, any improvement on that loneliness and emptiness and heartache, any improvement on that greed and hatred and conflict, less fighting, less cruelty, if you want my opinion, I think it's worse. And the tragedy is, as I discovered 10 or 12 years ago, the secret has been found. They discovered the atom. We don't have to go in search of solving it. We got the solution. Why don't we use it? We don't want it. That's why. Would you believe that? We don't want it. We don't want it. Can you imagine my saying to somebody, look, I'm going to give you a formula which would make you happy for the rest of your life. You'll enjoy every single minute of the rest of your life. Imagine my saying that to you, okay, I'm going to say that to you today. I'm going to give you the formula. I'm going to give it to you. You know what most of you are going to do? Sorry for insulting you in advance, okay? But if you're anything, <laughs> if you're anything like the audiences I've had till now, you know what most of you are going to do? You say, stop it! Don't tell me! Stop it! Don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. And you don't even have to take that on faith. I'm going to prove you're going to prove it to me before the end of today. Oh, we're going to have a lot of fun. You watch. <laughs> you don't want it. Six months ago, <clears throat> or oh, roughly six months ago, last summer, I was in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, giving a, a workshop, kind of a weekend workshop. Uh, there was a priest there who came to see me. He said, you know, I accept every single word you've said over these three days, every single word of it. And you know why? Not because I've done what you encouraged us to do, to cut and rub and scrape and analyze. He says, no. He said, about three months ago, I assisted an AIDS victim on his deathbed. And the man told me the following. He said, Father, six months ago, the doctor told me I had six months to live. How right he is, because oh, how right he was. He, the man was dying, see. He said, I had exactly six months to live, and I believed him. And you know something, Father? These have been the six happiest months of my 
whole misspent life happiest. In fact, I've never been happy till these six months. I discovered happiness. He said, as soon as the doctor told me that, I dropped tension, pressure, anxiety, hope, and fell not into despair but into happiness at last. And the priest said, you know, many is the time I've been reflecting on the words of that man. He said, when I heard you this weekend, I thought, the guy's come alive again. You're saying exactly what he said. Here's another guy who had it, who found it. You're Christians, most of you. You know, I'm accustomed to talking to groups that are not Christians either. Then I generally take the Quran. Uh, <clears throat> Philippians. For whatever the situation I find myself, you've got it right here, the formula's here. Well, he doesn't tell you how to do it, that I shall supply. <laughs> no, it's right here too, the formula's here too, how to do it is here too. But listen to what he says. For whatever the situation I find myself in, I have learned to be self-sufficient. Why do you mean self-sufficient? You're not vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, that goes. You'll be attacking me before the end of today. Yeah, yeah. For whatever the situation I find myself in, I have learned to be self-sufficient. I am experienced in being brought low and I have known what it meant to have abundance. I have learned how to cope with every circumstance. How to eat well or to go hungry. To be well provided for or to do without. I have learned to cope with every circumstance. How to eat well or to go hungry, to be well provided for or to do without. A little earlier he says, rejoice always, rejoice in the Lord. Again I say it, rejoice. I think of Ram Chandra in Calcutta. I think of that AIDS victim in St. Louis. That's what he's talking about. I had read it all my life and had never understood it. I mean, it was staring at me, staring me in the face, didn't grasp it. Okay, let's suppose you want to grasp it. Let's suppose you want to see it. What do you have to do? A. <clears throat> Understand a couple of truths about yourself. Then I'll throw the formula at you. And you make what you want of it. So here goes. What do you have to understand about yourself? First, your life is in a mess. Don't like to hear that? Well, maybe it proves that it's true. Your life is in a mess. Maybe you'll say to me, maybe, if you're like the average person I run in, into, your life is in a mess. People will say to me, what do you mean my life is in a mess? I'm doing pretty well in my studies. I got good parents. I got good relations with my family. I've got a boyfriend. I've got a girlfriend. Uh, everybody likes me. I'm doing well at sports. And I have a pretty brilliant career ahead of me. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Do you think your life is not in a mess? He says, no. All right, tell me. Here's the acid test. Ever feel lonely? Any heartache? Ever get upset by anything? You mean, aren't we supposed to get upset? You want the clean, clear, simple answer? Yeah, no. You mean not be upset by anything? That's right, you heard me. No. Shut up. I don't want to hear any more. See what I mean? He got a theory. He's got a theory. You got to be upset or you're not human. <laughs> okay, go ahead and be upset. 
good luck <laughs> bye you know there's a lovely saying by one of your american authors which i i frequently quote he says don't teach a pig to sing it wastes your time and irritates the pig <laughs> I had to learn the lesson the hard way. I've stopped trying to teach pigs to sing. You don't want to hear what I'm saying? Bye. No arguments. They don't argue. I'm ready to explain, ready to clarify. Why try to argue? Not worth it. So, <clears throat> ever suffer any interior conflict? You mean all your relationships are going well with everybody? Well, no. Your life is in a mess. You mean you're enjoying every single minute of your life? Well, not quite. Well, see what I told you? It's in a mess. Hey, wait a minute. The incarnation. Yeah, yeah. All right, bye. See you later. Alligator. <laughs> Why argue? I'm not interested in arguing with you, period. I know because I was doing that all along. Not interested in arguing. You either face the fact that your life is in a mess or you don't. You don't want to face it, I've got nothing to say to you. And your life is in a mess means you're a victim of heartache, at least occasionally. You feel lonely. There's emptiness staring at you. You're scared. You're scared? Yeah. Your life is in a mess. You mean we're not supposed to be scared? No, sir or madam, as the case may be. No. Not supposed to be scared. About anything? About anything. But Muhammad was... Excuse me, we'll deal with Muhammad later. All right, let's talk about you. Fearlessness. You don't know what it means. And the tragedy is you don't think it's available. It's so easy to get. Since they told you it's not available, you never try to find it. But it's right here all over the Bible. And you won't see it. Because they told you it's not available. You anxious for the future? Any whiff of anxiety, worry, upset? Yeah, you're in a mess. How about that? Want to clean it up? I'll clean it up for you five minutes, depending on how ready you are. You don't have to move out of that chair. You could be sitting in that chair and you could clean it up in five minutes. And I mean that. This isn't a sales gimmick. I mean it. It's so simple. And it's so deadly serious that people miss it. <laughs> and you can have it. You know, there's a... Do you know how they discovered the diamond mines in South Africa? It's a very interesting story. Uh, I read it some time back. This author says, I think it was an American. A guy, a white man, who was there in South Africa, was sitting at the hut of the headman of one of these South African villages. And he sees the kids <clears throat> there playing uh, with what looked like marbles. And his heart skipped a beat when he recognized that those weren't marbles at all. They were diamonds. Picked a couple of them up. Diamonds. So he says to the village headman, he says, uh, could you give me some of these? You know, I've got children back home who play a game too, and <laughs> yours are a bit different. Could you... You know, I'd be ready to give you a pouch of tobacco for this. And the chief laughed. He said, look, this would be highway robbery. I mean, it would be real robbery to take your tobacco for these things. We've got thousands of them here. So he gave him a basket full. The guy comes back, goes back with a lot of money, buys up all of that land. And within 10 years, he's the richest man in the world. Now, you know, that could be a parable. It's, it's tragic. It's painful to think. I mean, I, I think back on my own life and I think, why did I waste it? I wasted it. In all kinds of wonderful things, believe me. Uh, pastoral ministries, theological enterprises, uh, liturgical services, etc., etc., etc. You know, the more occupied we are in the things of God, we priests, the more likely we are to forget what God is all about. And the more complacent we're likely to become. That's the story of Jesus. Who do you think got rid of Jesus? The priests. Who else? The religious people. That's the, the, the terror of the gospel, see? All right. So now, 
I think I wasted it. I don't have a minute's regret. Why waste even a minute regretting the past? Okay, but the fact is I wasted it. I'm reminded of that powerful story of the fisherman who goes out early in the morning to fish. And it's too whatever. I don't understand these things, but apparently it's too dark or something. And his foot hits upon something that seems like a sack. So he picks it up, probably washed ashore from some shipwreck or whatever. Then he opens it and he can feel pebbles inside. So he takes these pebbles and he entertains himself till it's dawn, see, by, by flinging those pebbles far out into the sea and to see if he can judge from the plop how far he sent the pebble. Well, when it becomes a bit light and uh, the dawn begins to, or well, the day begins to dawn, he looks into the sack and he finds three precious stones there. God, they were filled with precious stones and he hadn't known it. Too late. <laughs> too late. Too late. Too late. Not too late. Three stones still. Not too late. Not too late. Uh, let's suppose, let's suppose this guy, huh? He's starving. The, these, these people who were sitting on top of those diamond mines, they're starving, their children are undernourished, etc. They're looking for food, they're begging, they're pleading with people to feed them. And someone says, hey, don't sell that property. You've got diamond mines. You see this thing? You see this thing? It's a diamond. You could sell it. You could get a hundred thousand dollars for this. You, They say, him no diamond, him stone. He got it in his head that that's a stone. Refuses to listen. No, that's a stone. Now that's the condition of people everywhere. They won't hear you. They won't listen. You're telling them life is extraordinary. Life is delightful. You could enjoy it. You wouldn't have a minute of tension. Not one. No pressure. No anxiety. You want it? Not possible. Never been done. Cannot be done. No spirit of research, of investigation. Let's find out. Let's go. No, no, no. Can't be done. I don't want to hear you. I mean, our priests have told us it can't be done. Our psychologists tell us it cannot be done. You coming to tell us it can be done? Out. <laughs> Too bad. All right. So the first thing, are you ready to admit that your life is in a mess? Second. This is a bit tougher, okay? You don't want to get out of it. You do not want to get out of the mess. You talk to any psychologist who's worth his name and he'll confirm that. The last thing a client wants is a cure. He doesn't want to get cured, he wants relief. Eric Byrne, one of your great psychiatrists here in the United States, puts it very graphically. I won't give his exact words because I'm a bit scared, you know, this is traveling how much did he say? 44,000 miles? I better use a respectable language. He says, uh, he says, imagine a client who's up to his uh, nose in a cesspool, okay? Yeah, he calls it liquid S-H-I-T. So, uh, uh, he's up to his uh, nose in, uh, in a cesspool, all right. And he's coming to you, and you know what he's saying to you? He's saying, could you help me so people won't make waves? doesn't want to get out. Oh, no, 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 get out for heaven's sake. No, just help me so they won't make waves. That's what he wants. He doesn't want to get out. He doesn't. You want to test that on yourself? I'll give you a couple of minutes. You could do it right now. You want to test it on yourself? Okay, here goes. Suppose you could be blissfully happy, but you're not going to get that degree. Ready to barter your degree for happiness? You're not going to get that girlfriend of yours or that boyfriend. Ready to barter them for happiness? Huh? 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 You know something? You're not going to be a success. You're going to fail. And everybody say he's a bum. But you'll be happy. You'll be blissfully happy. Ready to barter the good opinion of people for that? Oh, no. I'll give you time to think about it later. Oh, no. No, sir, or oh, madam, I'm told about that Chinese student who was learning English. And uh, he learned it from a book, of course, the poor kid. And this lady says, would you have a cup of tea? He says, uh, yes, sir, or madam, as the case may be. <laughs> so, 
So there it is. So no, sir. Or... So anytime I say no, you could take the madam for granted, as the case may be. All right. So no, sir. He's not ready. When I was in Syracuse last summer, I read a nice ad that says, you know, there's this girl holding on to a boy, the, the ad in the newspaper, and she says, I don't want to be happy. The only happy people I know are in a lunatic asylum. I want to be miserable with you. See what I mean? I don't want to be happy. I want to be miserable with you. She, she'll develop a theology about the damn thing after a while. <laughs> they don't want to get out of it. They don't want it. They don't want it. They don't want it. I don't want happiness. I want fame. I don't want happiness. I want to get that gold medal in the Olympics. Suppose I tell you, look, give up the gold medal. You'll be happy, damn it. What do you want that gold medal for? What do you want to be the top, the, the, the boss of the corporation for? I'll make you happy. On $10,000 a year, I'll make you happy. <gasps> no, 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 give me my money. My money, my money, my money, my money. <laughs> See what I mean now? Now you're catching on. They don't want to be happy. They don't want to live. They want money. You know that guy Ram Chandra, the rickshaw puller? Huh? Huh? He lived like a king. He lived like a king. I mean it. I mean it. Foreign aid is fine. He didn't need foreign aid. Not to live. He needed foreign aid for comfort. He needed it for health. Not for life. He might have needed it for longevity, which means, you know, a long life. But you call that a long, you call that life? Long existence. Not to live. He was living. I was dead. He knew what life was. He was happy. He was like the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. He was an incarnation of the Sermon on the Mount. It was all there in the Sermon on the Mount. I discovered later. It's all there. I hadn't seen it. He lived like a king. What does it mean to live like a king? You know what idiots think it means? And the world is peopled with them, believe me. Idiots. You know what they think it means? It means moving around in limousines, having everybody curtsy to them and salute them and all that sort of rubbish, all that sort of garbage, have their names in their headlines, they think that means having power over people, they think that's what it means to live like a king. I tell you what I think it means. They're not living like kings, they're slaves. They're terrified. Look at their faces on television. For heaven's sake, those kings and queens and presidents and the rest of them. Look at them on television, you'd recognize it at once. He's scared. You know why he's scared? Because he wants power, that's why. He wants prestige, he wants a reputation, that's why. He's not living like a king. I'll tell you what it means to live like a king. To know no anxiety at all. No inner conflict at all. No tensions, no pressures, no upset, no heartache. So then what are you left with? Happiness, undiluted. People sometimes say, what do I do to be happy? You don't do anything to be happy, silly. It shows how bad your theological education has been, that you think you've got to do something to be happy. You don't have to do anything to be happy. You can't acquire happiness. You know why? Because you have it. You got it right now. You got it. But you're the whole time blocking it in your stupidity. You're blocking it. Stop blocking it, you'll have it. If I could show you how to get rid of your conflicts, your anxieties, your tensions, your pressures, your emptiness, your loneliness, your despair, your depression, your heartache, you get rid of all of that, what are you left with? Sheer undiluted happiness, that's what you have. The Chinese put it beautifully. When the eye is unobstructed, they say, the result is sight. Don't do anything to get sight. When the eye is unobstructed, the result is sight. When the ear is unobstructed, the result is hearing. When the mouth is unobstructed, the result is taste. I will add later, 
when the mind is unobstructed, the result is truth. And when the heart is unobstructed, the result is joy and love. You've got it all, but it's obstructed. Drop it. So second major step, you don't want to get out of it. You want comfort. You want your little possessions. You want the little things that society has taught you are essential for happiness. Falsely, you want that. You don't want to get out of the mess. Those are the things that are creating the mess. Look, I've been talking too much. I've been talking for 45 minutes. I ought to give you a bit of a break. Let me do this. Let me give you something to talk about for two or three minutes. You can even stand up while you're talking about it. See, I don't want you to be sitting there so long stand up and stretch and talk about it and then maybe you want to ask me a few questions later I'll give you a somewhat longer break to uh, draw up a more formal questions you get what I'm saying more formal questions and uh, then we'll take in questions from outside too but we do that a bit later maybe uh, 15 minutes hence uh, why don't you stand up for a couple of minutes and think of this I'm going to give you something to talk about and to think of it's this has it ever occurred to you that what you call your happiness is really your chain? Has it ever occurred to you that what you call your happiness, just think, what do you call your happiness? You're calling somebody your happiness? You are my joy. Uh, your marriage, your business, your degree, whatever. Where do you find your happiness? In whom do you find your happiness? Your prison. Oh, this is hard language and who can listen to these words? But uh, reflect on it, cut, scrape, melt. Then maybe I could get a little reaction from you. Then I go right on with the presentation, kind of, you know, relentlessly on. And then we'll have a, a longer break. Take a couple of minutes, stand up, stretch, kind of thing, you know, relax. pick up the thread again your life is in a mess you don't want to get out of it there was another thing it's in a mess because you've got wrong ideas not because there's anything wrong with you you're okay and I'm okay you're okay we're all okay we're great there's nothing wrong with us they put wrong ideas into our head somebody did we needn't spend too much time try time trying to catch the culprit but anyway, the fact is you got wrong ideas. You know, it's like somebody gives you a stereo set and you get a manual of instructions that comes along with it. Well, they didn't give us a manual of instructions when they gave us the gift of life. Or let's put it the other way. They gave us the manual of instructions. It was all wrong. So you're not getting music. You're getting scratchy sounds. You're getting upset, you're getting conflicts, you're getting loneliness, you're getting emptiness. Oh, it was right there in the Bible, but very few people read it really. They think they do, but they miss the point. I miss the point. Maybe I'm an unusually big idiot, but uh, I discovered lots of company after a while. I said, I mean, uh, they missed the point too. They didn't get it. All right, so what is the point? Now, there are many ways of putting the formula. I'm going to give you the simplest I found. I'm going to give it to you in the words of old Buddha. Why did I choose him? Because his is the simplest of all. But you find it everywhere. It's the simplest of all. Uh, enunciated with limpid clarity. You're probably going to disagree with it, but you can't miss the point. Here it is. The world is full of sorrow. The root of sorrow is desire. The uprooting of sorrow is desirelessness. 
Oh, I'm looking at your faces. It's wonderful you're thinking. That's great. That's great. And you're thinking wrong. That's awful. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? Because I know how, how I used to react to this. The world is full of sorrow. Great. Right. Agreed. The root of sorrow is desire. Well, all right. Now, what are you going to conclude? The uprooting of sorrow is desirelessness. So I'm going to be a vegetable? I mean, how do we live without desires? Ah, oh, you got it. See, I was on. I got it. I got it. Let's give you a better translation. I mean, I, I don't think Buddha would be so foolish and stupid as to say we ought to have no desires, for heaven's sake. I wouldn't be here if I didn't have the desire to come here, right? I wouldn't be speaking if I didn't have the desire to speak. You wouldn't be here if you didn't have the desire to come and hear me. So, let's, let's give, give it a better translation. The world is full of sorrow. The root of sorrow is attachment. The uprooting of sorrow means the uprooting, the dropping of attachments. You know there are desires on whose fulfillment my happiness does not depend. You got lots of desires on whose fulfillment your happiness does not depend. Or else you'd be climbing walls, you'd be nervous wrecks. We all of us have two types of desires. We got desires, you know, we desire all kinds of things, and gee, we're we're happy to get them. And we don't get them, okay, too bad. We're not unhappy. But we've got other desires. Good Lord, if we don't get that, we're going to be miserable. That's what he calls an attachment. Where do you think all conflicts come from? Attachments. Where do you think greed comes from? Attachments. Where do you think loneliness comes from? Attachments. Where do you think emptiness comes from? You got it. Same cause. Where do you think fears come from? My, how clever you're becoming. Attachments. No attachment, no fear. Ever thought of that? No attachment, no fear. I'm going to take your life. Go right ahead. No attachment to your life. Happy to live. Happy to let go. You think that's possible? You know something? People have attained it. So it is possible. Want to attain it yourself? <gasps> Attachment. Sorry, sir, you have AIDS. You only have six months to live. Just six months? Boy, that's a lot of time to live. That's wonderful. Happiness. Hey, this guy got no attachment. You walk into a restaurant. I think we'll have soup tonight. What kind of soup do you have? Do you have tomato soup? Uh, no, sorry, sir. No tomato soup. No tomato soup, for heaven's sake. I mean, what kind of a restaurant is this? Come on, folks. We're going somewhere else. See, if I don't get tomato soup, I can't have dinner. Attachment. Uh, what kind of soup do you have? Tomato soup? No tomato soup. Well, what do you have? Well, we got sweet corn, we got uh, mushroom soup, we got chicken broth, we got... Pretty good, I like all of those. How about uh, mushroom? Let me slip in another little secret. I'm going to cheat on old Buddha right now and slip another little one in while we're on this point. You know, when you enjoy the scent of a thousand flowers, you're not going to feel too bad about the absence of one. Nobody ever told you that in your culture, did they? They didn't tell me. When you enjoy the taste of a thousand dishes, you're not going to feel too bad about the absence of one. Do you recollect being educated to enjoy a thousand dishes? 
so that nothing upsets you. See, if we missed that, we got this. What do you know? Oh, no, no, no. You've got to get this. That's what your culture and mine is training us for. We got the wrong instructions. They don't give a damn whether you and I are happy or not. They want us to achieve. They want us to produce. That's what they want. Even if we're going to be miserable slaves and unhappy. So, it's a big deal. You lost a friend. You got one million friends. No, not that kind. I want one personal, unique, unsubstitutable friend. So if he rejects me, then I'm miserable for the rest of my life. Good luck. Bye. I'm not teaching this big to sing. Too dangerous. But that's the way we've been brought up. That's the way it has been for, for thousands of years. You've got to have desires on whose fulfillment your happiness depends. Very good for so-called progress, of course, huh? huh? Because you'll throw all you have into the, the, the enterprise. So-called progress. I call it so-called because that's not progress to me. That isn't progress. You mean, isn't it progress when we have jumbo jets and spaceships? Very clever. I'll tell you what is progress. Heart progress. Love progress. Happiness progress. You got that? Oh, sorry, we don't have that. You can keep the rest. What's the use of it? Tell me, what's the use of moving around in aeroplanes with a heart that is full of misery and emptiness? Tell me. I'd rather live on the ground in a jungle and be blissfully happy and dancing all day. Wouldn't you? Maybe you wouldn't. I don't know. You see, you're really confronted with the choice of life or death. And what people call life is frequently death. And they don't know it. And you mean to tell me that if you've got attachments, you can love? The biggest enemy to love, attachments. Desire in the sense of attachment. You know why? Because if I desire you, I want to possess you. I can't leave you free. I got to get you. I got to manipulate you so that I can get you. If I desire you in this way, I'm going to manipulate myself so that I can hoodwink you into getting you. You following what I'm saying? Clear enough? Oh, yeah, you're on. All right, wonderful. So then I got fears. You call this love? You call this love? I mean, you're lacking intelligence. Love, for heaven's sake. I'm not leaving you free. I'm not leaving me free. I'm manipulating you. I'm manipulating myself. I'm trying every means to get you. And, and there's fear. And so it is said so beautifully. Perfect love casts out fear. No fear in perfect love. You know why? Because there's no desire. Now, ask your culture. I've asked mine. Ask your culture if it make, can make any sense out of this statement. Where there is love, there is no desire. Desire in the sense of attachment, okay? Okay? Attachment. You know what they tell you? But attachment is love. That's how stupid they are. Then you expect to find life. You can only find death and misery. You say, how, how could you love if you don't feel attachment? Later, I'll keep this for the end of the day, I'll talk explicitly about love. Such a simple, such a sublime, such an extraordinary thing. And I rarely run into anyone. Believe me, I, I'm serious. I mean every word I'm saying. I run into all kinds of people. I run into people of all kinds of religions. And I run into Catholics and, and non-religious people, you know, people who, who are atheists or whatever. And I run into Catholics or lay people and priests and sisters and bishops. And I rarely run into someone who knows what love is. They got the wrong instructions. 
So when I tell them, hey, how could love be attachment? They're arguing about it. And then, of course, after five minutes, they say, you're right. You mean you've lived 55 years, you've uh, written books on theology, and you haven't seen this? He says, no. Well, I'll give you some comfort. I lived about as much as you did, and I hadn't seen it either, if that's any comfort to you. But it's so obvious. Attachment meaning, without you, I will not be happy. Got to get you. Attachment means, I got to get you. If I don't get you, I won't be happy. I cannot be happy without you. There you've got the formula for divorce. There you've got the formula for quarrels. There you've got the formula for friendships falling apart. I cannot be happy without you. I need you for my happiness. By damn, I'll do everything to manipulate you to get you. <laughs> Love means I'm perfectly happy without you, darling. It's all right. And I wish you're good. And I leave you free. And when I get you, I'm delighted. And when I don't, I'm not miserable. What do you know? I have learned to be self-sufficient. I'm standing up on my own two feet, not leaning on you. And you know, if I get money, that's wonderful. And if I don't get money, I'm not depressed. I'm happy. And you know something else? When you go away, I don't... Maybe it's too soon to say that here. But anyway, I'll risk it. I don't miss you. I don't feel pain where there is sorrow. There is no love. Tell me, when you grieve, whom are you grieving for? Who's loss? Self-pity? Oh, don't call it that. You're telling the truth now. <laughs> Here's the formula. If you were not actively engaged in making yourself miserable, you would be happy. We were born happy. All life is shot through with happiness. Oh, there's pain. Of course there's pain. Who told you you can't be happy without pain? Come and meet a friend of mine who's dying of cancer. And she's happy in pain. So, we were born happy. We lost it. We were born with the gift of life. We lost it. We got to rediscover it. Why did we lose it? Because we were working actively. They taught us to work actively to make ourselves miserable. How did they do that? By teaching us to become attached. By teaching us to have desires so intense that we would refuse to be happy unless they were fulfilled. The tragedy is, my dears, the tragedy is that all you need to do is to sit down for two minutes and just watch how untrue it is that you would be unhappy without A or B or X or Y or whatever. Do you know something? You won't sit because if you sit, you might see it. You won't sit and look at it. I know I wouldn't. I resisted it for years. You mean if I don't get Mary Jane or I don't get John, I won't be happy? Hey, wait a minute. That's false. Before I met him, I was happy. And you know something? I once fell in love with somebody and then, well, I lost her and I was heartbroken. And what happened? I'm all right now. So she wasn't my happiness after all. Remember the time I was, you were a child and you lost something? And you thought, I'll never be happy without this. What happened? If we gave it to you today, you wouldn't look at it. Why don't we learn? Oh, no, no. We got to live in illusions. It feels good. It gives you a kick, doesn't it? It gives me a kick. We want kicks. We don't want happiness. We want thrills. And whenever you've got a thrill, you've got an anxiety. Because you might lose it. Or you may not get it. And you got a depression following. You got a hangover. It's so simple as I told you, I could put it down for you in two minutes. Whether you'll hear it is another question. That depends on your own heart. 
So here it is, the world is full of sorrow. The root of sorrow is attachment desire. The uprooting of sorrow is the dropping of attachment. How does one drop it? One only looks and sees that it is based on a false belief. The belief that without this I cannot be happy. That's false. The moment you see it's false, you're free. Good luck to you. May take you one minute. May take you 25 years. But the day you see it, you're free. You're free as a bird. You know, you'll be coming up to give satellite retreats. You'll be talking to presidents. You'll be meeting popes. You won't be one bit faced. You're free. You're free. You're completely free. You'll be making an ass of yourself. You won't bother. You won't bother to impress any. You know what that means? That you're not bothered to impress anybody? You know what it means? That you don't give a... Is damn a swear word in the United States? Maybe I shouldn't be using it. You don't give a tinker's damn what they think about you and what they say about you. You know what that means? Oh boy, that's freedom. You're not bothered about whether they approve of you or they don't. It's alright. You're happy. You don't approve. Alright, too bad. That one failed. We move on. I'm happy. <laughs> But that's because you've discovered that your happiness does not lie in these things. You've got to see that for yourself. Useless reading a book, useless listening to me, you've got to see it. And of course you won't see it if you've got the wrong formula. I'll deal with the questions right now, okay? Yes, this is Valerie Wolf. Does the dropping of attachments um, translate into detachment from the material world? Good, all right. And what's the second one? Um, the second one is um, we've been taught to identify with the sufferings of Christ. Uh, can we do that if we're always happy? Oh, great questions. All right. Now, would you give me your name again, please? Yes, this is Valerie Wolf. Valerie. Well, thank you very much, Valerie. Thanks for calling. I'll deal with the questions right now. Uh, all right. Here goes then. Does this mean dropping of attachments? Does it mean detachment from the material world? No. No. Uh, one uses the material world. One enjoys the material world. But one doesn't make one's happiness depend on the material world. Is, is that clear enough? Like, look, what I'm saying is, you really begin to enjoy things when you're unattached because attachment brings anxiety. If you're anxious when you're holding on to something, you could hardly enjoy it. So, what I'm offering you is not a withdrawal from enjoyment. It's a withdrawal from possessiveness, from anxiety from tension, from depression at loss of something. So I trust that would be clear enough. The second question was a pretty good one too. We're taught to identify with the sufferings of Christ. How would this uh, link in with what I was saying about happiness? All right, let me clarify this a bit further. Uh, maybe the best way to do it would be by means of a story. It was a great Zen master, they say, who uh, was reported to have attained enlightenment. And one day his disciples said to him, uh, Master, what did you get from enlightenment? And uh, he said, well, I'll tell you this. Before I was enlightened, I used to be depressed. After I got enlightened, I continue to be depressed. You seem puzzled, huh? <laughs> you see, the depression hasn't changed. His attitude to the depression has changed. He's not saying, I'm not going to be happy till this depression goes away. Because strange as it may seem, you know, you could even be serene and calm 
and happy while the depression is going on? You're not fighting it. You're not upset about it. You're not irritated about it. You're not trying to... No, you're serene. That's the difference. So can one go through physical hardships and even emotional sufferings and not be upset about them? That's the key word. That's the operative word. Oh, to find the secret for this. All right, we have another couple of calls. Let's try one or two more of those. Okay, you're on the air. Let's have your name and uh, would you identify the location you're in? This is Patrick Mahon at St. Joseph's Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. Great, Patrick. Thanks for calling. Let's have the question. If happiness is not attachment, how do you define it in positive terms? Wonderful. All right, did you hear that? If happiness is not attachment, how would you define it in positive terms? Uh, thanks, Patrick. I hope to deal with that right now. My, he, he really has me on that one, eh? Patrick does. <laughs> you know something? Happiness cannot be defined. At least I haven't found one. I haven't found a definition. As a matter of fact, you have no idea of what happiness is till you've dropped attachment. So it could only be defined as the dropping of illusion, the dropping of attachment. When misery caused by attachment is dropped, happiness is attained. Uh, of course, one could use words like peace, serenity, being above it all, uh, enjoying every moment as it occurs, living in the present. The words, these are words. You don't know what sight is till the eye is unobstructed. You don't know what happiness is until attachment desires are dropped then you know. And the words don't matter anymore. Well, I trust that's good enough, Patrick. Let's uh, take one more, and then we'll take someone in the group here. Yes. Uh, would you identify yourself, please, and your location? Uh, this is uh, Rich Redman at Georgetown University. Yes, Rich. And the question is, if Christ is a model of, uh, for us of detachment and of happiness, uh, we, how do we identify with uh, his loneliness in the garden and being his anger in the temple and being forsaken on the cross? Great. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Did you get that? All right. You know, Christ himself went through periods, it would seem, of uh, loneliness, very well identified by Rich here, of anger, of abandonment on the cross, etc. Are these states compatible with happiness? What do you think? Is it possible that either because of one's programming because of one's culture or simply because of one's human psyche and body, one would go through all kinds of sufferings and yet somehow be above it all. What do you think? Yes, no, what? <laughs> yes, yes. Before enlightenment, I used to be lonely. After enlightenment, I'm still lonely, but loneliness isn't what it used to be anymore. You know, I think uh, in the, the, the session we have after lunch, I'll talk more explicitly about these phenomena, loneliness, emptiness. Where do they come from? What causes them? Uh, is it possible that they would disappear completely? I think so. You know, we Christians continually teach that Jesus was a man. He was a human being like everyone else. And like every human being was subjected to all of these things. 
does one eventually gradually outgrow them? Some of us do, others don't. Jesus could outgrow them, may, may not have outgrown them. One knows so little about this, but this much is clear that one does have a state of serenity, of happiness, even when these clouds pass by. Let me give you an example to show you what I'm talking about. You see, you've got the clouds and you've got the sky. And many of the Oriental masters will be saying, before this state of what they call enlightenment, of what I'm inviting you to do, to see, before they saw, they would identify themselves with the clouds. And they'd be all caught up in that. After enlightenment, they identify themselves with the sky. Oops, there comes a cloud, black cloud. It comes and goes. I'll show you how this is done this afternoon. Again, it's so simple, it seems incredible. Then after a while you say, hey, about six months since a black cloud came. But you know, I'm not going to make my happiness on, depend on their coming or not coming. Get what I say, what I'm saying? All right, great. Or else what's going to happen now is you're going to be tense about not being depressed. Oh gosh, so now another cause for it. <laughs> you're going to get attached to this imaginary state that you call happiness. So what we have to do is watch for those attachments, understand them, see that they are based on a false belief, and they will drop then you'll know what I'm talking about. How about have a question from here? Then we go back to calls that are coming from outside. Anyone have a question here? Would you stand up, please, and wait till Chris comes along with the mic? That'd be great. Give us your name. Hello, Father. I'm Peter Shea from Fordham Peter. University. Right. Father, you've been saying a lot about being able to experience suffering uh, and depression and yet still be I'm just telling it. Um, I'm, I'm trying to understand clearly what you're saying, but it seems such a contradiction to say that you can be happy and depressed, since depression, as I've always been taught, is the abs absence of contentment and happiness. I'm still a little unsure about that. That's a good question, Peter. I'm glad you're pressing it, because it'll help me to, to make this a bit clearer. See? Aren't depression and happiness two contradictory states? I think this is what you're saying, right? Yes. yes and no. If for you, happiness means thrills, fun, pleasure, yes, they are contradictory. But thrills, fun, pleasure are not happiness. What are they? They're thrills, they're fun, they're pleasure, they're not happiness. Happiness is a state of non-attachment. You know, for many years I didn't even think such a thing existed. For me, to be happy meant to have fun. To be happy meant to win, to get what you wanted. This is what people ordinarily understand by happiness. Most cultures understand happiness to mean you get what you want, so you're happy. You know the way it is? Yay, I got what I want and I'm happy. But that isn't happiness. That's a thrill. That's getting what you want. Depression is frequently, not always, not getting what you want. It's the opposite of the thrill. You go in for thrills, you're going to be depressed. It's the other side of the pendulum. Oh, you're going to have to do a lot of thinking on that. It's the thrills that cause the depression. Of course, depressions have physical cause, causes too. So you see, I'm not talking about happiness meaning thrills, fun, pleasure. I'm talking of, hap of happiness meaning one is above it all. One is serene. One is not attached to its coming and going. There's one more thing I'll add. The more you fight depression, the worse it gets. Don't resist evil. 
when they strike you on one cheek, turn and offer the other. When you take away one devil, seven more come. How does one deal with these things by not fighting them? Because the more you fight them, the more you empower them. Quite a number of calls. Uh, let's take a couple more. Yes, you're on the line. Let's have your name and the location and your question. Hello. Good morning, Anthony. Good morning. This is Susan Stadinger from yes. Buffalo State College in Buffalo, New York. Buffalo. Yes, Susan. And the nature of my question is quite different from the previous ones. Okay. So I have two assumptions, and then I'd like you to apply one of your earlier statements. Assuming that I am attached to my experience as a Catholic, uh, United States woman religious, and that I have been educated in the post-Vatican II time, and secondly, assuming that I am also tempered by my experience of the, the total change and transition that that has met in the last 20 years, I'd like you to apply your beginning metaphor of the monks and scholars being challenged to analyze words like goldsmiths analyze gold, cutting and scraping and rubbing and melting, I'd like you to apply that metaphor, if possible, to the current situation in the United States Church. Uh-oh, I can see where you're getting me, Susan. I'm not biting, but thanks, thanks. That's wonderful. And I'll deal with that. Okay, Susan, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> you see where she's taking me to also, have you? Well, 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 well. Okay. Look, I think, and let me say this quite unambiguously. I think that the United, the Church of the United States, in quite a number of areas, is at the cutting edge today. It's offering leadership to the rest of the world, and particularly in the matter of women's rights. And I think uh, centuries hence, the Church is going to be grateful for this. And of course, you're running into your difficulties. Every time change is in the offing, you're going to run into conflict. You're going to run into difficulties because people hate change. They, they, they want, don't want change. They want progress without change. <laughs> All right. So you're naturally going through your birth pangs and your teething difficulties in the church, etc. But let me add this. You know, there's a lovely sentence in the Hindu scriptures, the Bhagavad Gita, where the Lord Krishna says to Arjun, to the, the kind of the, the main character in the book, as some of you may probably know, the, the setting, the scene is set on a battlefield. And this young prince is saying, why do I have to get into battle? And the Lord says to him very beautifully, he says, plunge into the heart of battle, plunge into the din of battle and keep your heart at the lotus feet of the Lord. That's the formula. Plunge into the din of battle and keep your heart at the lotus feet of the Lord, at peace. Is it possible to get into the din of battle, to fight the good fight and be at peace? Of course it is. Of course it is. All the great mystics attained that. Because if you're not at peace, believe me, you're going to do much more damage than good. Oh, the damage you're going to, to do. You know why? Because it isn't the Lord's battle you're fighting. It's the ego's battle. And the sign that you will know that it isn't the ego. The cause is a very just one. But when your ego gets messed up in it, oh, gee. So there it is. You could get right into the battle. I'll have more to say about this in the next session. You get right into remedy situations, but your heart is at peace. And nothing's going to destroy your happiness. Wouldn't it be awful if you fought the good fight and uh, you lost your happiness as a result? Don't have to do that. One more. Yes, you're on the line. Hi, my name is Michelle Karanin. Michelle, all right. I'm from the University of Dayton. Marvelous. Go right ahead, Michelle. We're listening. Okay. Um, you said when you talked of true freedom, 
Uh -huh. He said not to bother whether someone approves or disapproves. If they don't approve, you say, so what, I'm happy. My, that's tremendous. Go right ahead. You, <laughs> Okay. I had a difficult time with that, understanding that, because I thought that was sort of selfish. I thought you should also have freedom in doing things for others, not necessarily for approval, but just for the sake of giving. Oh, that's marvelous. Yes, all right, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Well, maybe I didn't make myself clear enough, see? I'm not saying we don't care about other people. We care very much. We're very sensitive to them. But we're not controlled by their approval or disapproval. See, I'm glad she brings this up, so it gives me a chance to make it clearer. So you're very sensitive to people, but you're giving them what you think is good for them, but you're not being controlled by them. Do you follow what I'm saying? In other words, I'm not going to desist from what I think is good just because you disapprove. And I'm not going to do what I think is bad because I think you approve. So I'm not being controlled by you. Only there is true love. Good, let's get another one. Isn't it marvelous we can get these people from all over the states? This is great. Yes, uh, you're on the line. You're on the air. Is there some, some other way we can get in contact? Huh? Uh, you're on the air right now. Oh, hello, Tony. Yes, yes, this is Tony. <laughs> Good. Hey, I'm calling from Lorain Community College at Elyria, Ohio. Uh-huh. What's your name? I wanted to know why does uh, religion seem to so often always get in the way of happiness for people? Why? Would you say that again, please? Why does religion, like organized religion, seem to always get in the way of happiness? Why does it always seem to get in the way of happiness? Well, all right. Uh, uh, would you give me your name, please? The truth is on occasion. You know, it's lost its mystical quality. Yes, it's lost its mystical All right, thank you. Thank you. Well, I wouldn't say religion always gets in the way of people. No, no, no. It's always in danger of losing its mystical quality. How true, how true, how true. You want to see politics? You find it in religion. You want to see dirty infighting? You find it in religion. You want to see crucifixions of Messiah? Where do you think you get it from? Religion. So it's like... Uh, you know, it's a sad irony, and it's right there in the, in the New Testament. The horror of the New Testament is that it was reserved to the religious people to crucify the Messiah. Not the Romans, not the colonialists, not the multinationals, not the imperialists, not the bloodsuckers, the money lenders, but the religious people. That's the horror of the New Testament. So it is true that religion is always in danger of doing this. Uh, but religion also preserves the mystical element. I think we'd be too one-sided if we denied that. You know, heavens, would I have seen what I have seen these years, these last few years, if I had not been a Jesuit? And oh yes, you know, the organization has lots of disadvantages, tremendous disadvantages. I can see that. It has all of its handicaps. I sometimes think it's something like our mother, see. Uh, mother has her good points and her bad points. And she's mother. We love her with, with, with it all, kind of, see. And sometimes we don't take too much notice of what she's saying. She belongs to another age, okay. And sometimes we take some of her great wisdom and we, we learn to kind of assess what's good and bad and we love her just the way she is so we so I can see how religion while having all of its uh, its drawbacks its tremendous drawbacks we always have to be on the alert we religious people to see that it doesn't come in the way of truth and of the mystical it also thank God still keeps some of its beauty and some of its original goodness let's have one more and then we come to the the hall here all right, you're on the line. Good morning, Father Good Darrell. morning. My name is Marie Materatundo, and I'm calling mm. from the Diocese of Fresno, St. Paul Newman Center, and the Office of Youth Ministries. And we have two questions for you today. Okay, Marine. Okay. Does no attachment mean that we should not participate in the very human, creative endeavors of hoping and dreaming? That's the first question. Mm -hmm. And secondly, how do you suggest that we deal with feelings of loss and grief and the other things that are part of our human experience? My great questions, Marine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 
All right. Does it mean we withdraw from the human endeavor, having no attachment? No, no, no. Plunge into the din of battle. And you know, you have so much more energy, believe me, when you have no attachments. You've got all of your energy available to you. The great Chinese sage, Chuang Tzu, how marvelously he puts it. Uh, I remember learning this by heart. Let's see if it comes off. If it doesn't come off, we won't feel bad, will we? Well, let's, let's get started. All right. He says, when the archer shoots for nothing, he has all his skill. When he shoots for a brass buckle, he is already nervous. When he shoots for a prize of gold, he goes blind. He's out of his mind. He sees two targets. His skill has not changed, but the prize divides him. He cares. He thinks more of winning than of shooting. And the need to win drains him of power. Isn't that sublime? The need to win drains him of power. If he didn't need to win, He'd have so much more energy. So no one joins in the human enterprise of human dreams and visions and goals so marvelously and so creatively as the person who's unattached. You know, unfortunately, we've come to associate unattachment with not caring, with not enjoying, with asceticism. No, I'm not talking about that at all. Well, you'll see this as we go on, I guess, uh, along the day. Uh, and that second, uh, that's a bit more of a touchy question, the one of grief. Well, shall I tell the truth or shall I soften it? What do you think? You, you better decide that. <laughs> soften it? Shall I? All right. All right. We'll say it like it is. I wouldn't grieve if I wasn't attached. I wouldn't grieve if it were not for my loss. I wouldn't grieve if in some way you were not my happiness. But when I enjoy you wholly, I love you in the sense of I'm sensitive, I care, it is your good I seek, and I leave you free. And you are not my happiness. I have not given over to you the power to decide whether I will be happy or not. Then I do not grieve at your absence or at your rejecting, at your rejection, or at your death. That's hard. You may need many months to digest that one. But until you arrive at this state, all right, grief is wonderful. One drains it out of one's uh, system gradually, and then one comes back to life again. They tell me there's a call from Canada. How about taking that one? Would that be all right? Okay, let's give Canada a chance. Okay, Canada, you're on the, on the air. That's wonderful. Hi. Would... My name is Charles MacDonald. Charles, all right, Charles. Charles, calling from the University College of Cape Breton. Uh-huh. Sydney, Nova Scotia, Canada. Wonderful. Well, I like very much your comments about lost opportunities and those images you brought there, eh? The stories about the fishermen. That's right. Beautiful story. Now, I think that a lot of people believe that the world is in a mess, but they don't think that their own lives are in a mess. And How the way true. they want to solve the world's mess is through commitment to causes. How true. I'm wondering, how do you distinguish between uh, commitment and attachment or commitment and detachment. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, the two things there. First, the world's in a mess. I'm in a mess. You know, don't hide behind a peace committee. It solves nothing. You know, when a, a bunch of wolves sit in on a peace committee, you're not going to get peace. When uh, a thousand wolves organize for justice, you're not going to get justice. You've got to deal with the wolves. So he's so right in saying, 
we've got to take a look at ourselves too. But then the other thing, how does one, well, commit oneself to a cause? Well, that's fine. Commit yourself wholeheartedly into the dinner battle, but you're above it. As somebody said so beautifully once, for peace of heart, resign as general manager of the universe. Like, I'm not the general manager, I do what I can, I plunge in, and the result is left to God, to life, to destiny. Uh, let's take a couple of calls from here, and then we'll end the session. Anybody have a call here? All right. Uh, would you wait till the... All right. Thanks, How you doing? Um, I'm Paul Provosto from the Marinal School of Theology. Yes, Paul. And I'd like to ask this. Before you said we have to watch out for attachments so that we can become unattached. Wouldn't that result in anxieties of constantly worrying about what you're attached to? Oh, uh, yes. How do right. you break this vicious cycle? Okay. All right. No, I wouldn't say watch out, Paul. I'd say watch them, look at them, understand them, study them. Like, how does one detect an attachment? The moment there's upset there's an attachment lurking under it. Now, you'd say, upset, huh? Hmm. Because uh, you're not getting what you want. Mm -hmm. Or you're getting what you don't want. That's right. Or you're about to lose what you want. That's right. Which means you're refusing to be happy unless you get what you want. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. Uh, you mean, if I don't get this, I'm not going to be happy? You mean, this is my happiness? You mean, a person, a human being, cannot be happy without this? Oh, no, he can. She can. There are human beings who are happy without this. This might take you anywhere from two seconds to two or three hours to five or six days, where you wouldn't be thinking about this repeatedly, but your mind is going at it. You know, I'll tell you one thing. The moment you dare to expose yourself even for two seconds, to truth, you're finished. You're finished. Because if you glimpse it even once, something in you will be taking you back to it. That's why maybe something inside of us fears to look. If you see, well, it may take a while, but you'll be driven back again. And you'll be increasingly freed and made happy and liberated. I thought there was another question here. So, yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Pat Sakatrick, and I'm from the Graduate School of Religion at Fordham. Yes, Pat. Uh, basically, my question revolves around this. There seems to exist a tension between um, being aware of a state of detachment. That's probably not the right way to put it. And also that pulling toward what society says you have to do to be successful. And how do you resolve that tension or even that sense of one's pride that gets in the way? When Great. You okay, Pat. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Did you get the question? It's like a pull. On the one hand, happiness, peace, serenity, being mm, self-possession, if you want, being above it. On the other hand, the drive that society has put into us to be successful. How does one resolve it? Just redefine success. Redefine it. What is success? Now, that's not going to come easy if you're too much in the grips of what will they think, what will they say. What Pats calls pride. Uh, I wouldn't call it pride. I'd call it a kind of a, a total dependence for one's worth on others. If you think I'm worthwhile, I'm worthwhile. If you adjudge me a success, I'm a success. If you don't, I'm not. Oh, who will give us the grace to break out of that? When I meet a man or a woman who has broken out of that, I salute. Not the other ones. The big commanders and the presidents. Oh. very inferior human beings. Not one bit better than the average. 
lustful, greedy, frightened, anxious, ambitious, grasping, controlled like puppets by what people think and what people say, and so captured, so enslaved by the desire for power and this. You want me to respect that? But then I run into a guy like Ram Chandra. My, he has my admiration. I run into the kind of person, this AIDS victim in St. Louis. I didn't have the privilege of meeting that man, but that man has my admiration. See, we're admiring the wrong thing, the things, Pats. And this goes for most of our religious institutions. They say, you've got to make it. And they're so honored that an ex-alumnus has become blob. Is this what we value? See? So, or do we value the person who has broken out of the clutches of society? Do we value riches? Like you're giving a million dollars, you get the front row. We va Christian institution, did you say, Father? So it goes, see, as somebody pointed out, we're so much in danger. Of, we're brainwashed, we're bom bombarded constantly by this viewpoint. We're indoctrinated. Now I'll address myself to this question, so that way, it's a nice introduction to what I'll be saying this afternoon. I'll be addressing myself to this question this afternoon, after about an hour, uh, to this stranglehold that society has on us. Is it possible to break out of that? Okay, here we go again. <laughs> Ready for more work? <laughs> All right. I thought of a couple of stories to tell you on my way here to illustrate a bit what I was trying to communicate this morning, see? And then while I was sitting here waiting for, for us to come on, I thought of a better one. There's a Japanese master, a fellow called Bokoju. See, every time I think of his name, I imagine a plump, rotund kind of a guy, happy-go-lucky soul, Bokoju. It was said of Bokoju that every morning when he woke up, he'd give a great big belly laugh that resounded through the 250 cells of the monastery. Everyone could hear him. Everybody woke up with that laughter, like the alarm clock, see? <laughs> great big belly laugh. And he'd go on for about three or four minutes. And the last thing he did at night before he went to bed was again let out a great big belly laugh and then he'd curl up on his mat and go to sleep. <laughs> and the disciples were very curious to know what it was that made the master laugh. And they tried their level best to get him to tell them. But he wouldn't. And he died without telling them. That's the end of the story. <laughs> so all kinds of people have been trying to figure out what was it that made him laugh. 
I got a couple of hunches myself. <laughs> you know, we have an Indian mystic, uh, Indian mystic called Kabir. Kabir has some extraordinary mystical poems, and one of them begins with the line, I laughed when they told me that the fish in the water is thirsty. How about that one? I laughed when they told me that the fish in the water is thirsty. You mean, you're in the water? Mm -hmm. You're a fish? Mm -hmm. You're thirsty? Oh, come on. But we are, aren't we? Or another line that I read last summer, somewhere here in the States, of uh, an African hunter, uh, well, an American hunter who would be hunting in Africa. He said he, he lived with some natives there, and whenever they were in danger, he said it was quite extraordinary. They'd look at us white men, says this man, with a strange kind of curiosity when they saw fear in our eyes. It was incomprehensible to them, to this particular group of natives, okay? It was incomprehensible to them, says this writer. Like uh, looking into the eyes of fishes who were afraid to get drowned. That's pretty good too. Can you imagine a fish scared of drowning? And so again and again, the mystical teachers of the world have been posing this question. They're, they're puzzled. Why are they unhappy? That kind of thing. Why are they scared? That kind of thing. And of course, still one has seen, it makes sense to feel scared. It makes sense to be unhappy. You know, when I talk about fear, I'm not talking about the present response to immediate danger. I'm not talking about that. That the animals have. I'm talking about fear of what's going to come, fear of what's going to happen. I'm talking about that. And this, the mystics tell us, doesn't exist. In their mind, simply doesn't exist. Boy, what a state to be in. Extraordinary. Well, here we are with these, you know, there's another nice story about this. There's this camel trader, an Arab, who's walking across the Sahara Desert and they pitch tent for the night and the slaves, uh, you know, drive pegs into the ground, ground and tie the camels to the pegs. Then they come in to say to the master, there's only, there are only 19 pegs and we've got 20 camels. How do we tie the 20th camel? And the master said, these camels are stupid animals. Just go through the motions of tying the camel and he'll stay put all night, which is what they did. And the camels stood there, you know, convinced of it. <laughs> and next morning, when they uh, lifted tent and they continued on their journey, the slaves came to complain that all the camels were following except this one. This one refused to budge. And the master said, you forgot to untie him. They said, oh, yes. So they went through the motions <laughs> of untying him. That is an image of the human condition. We're scared about things that are not. We're tied to things that don't exist. They're illusions. They're falsehoods. They're beliefs. They're not realities. The agonies we go through over things that we have, we have convinced ourselves our happiness depends upon, but it doesn't, it just doesn't. And we don't want to see it. Again, the mystics, I mean, I guess they understand this because they went through this themselves. They're in amazement that the human being would deceive himself or de people would fool themselves in this way. Now, you know, what I'm going to offer you today is the beginning. 
you don't need anyone else to, to show you the way. If you keep following this, as I said to you in the previous session, you just get a glimpse of this and you keep at it, you'll find the way and sooner or later you'll discover what this means. You're tied to things that don't exist. They don't exist. The story of the disciple who goes to the master and the master says, what have you come here for? And the man says, moksha. Moksha is the Sanskrit word for freedom. <coughs> I've come for freedom. Oh, freedom, says the master. Mm -hmm. Go and find out who has bound you. So the guy goes back and meditates for a week and comes back and says, uh, no one has bound me. And what do you want freedom for, says the master. And in that minute, the disciple's eyes are opened and he attains freedom. He attains liberation. <coughs> what have you come here for? Freedom. Go and find out who has bound you. Well, no one has bound me. Then what do you want freedom for? You're free already. Why do you seek it? But you don't understand it because you've tied yourself with all kinds of imaginary chains. So this is going to be the theme of the present session. We're going to take it a little bit at a time, okay? We take little breaks and stuff so it won't be too heavy on you. Let's take it one step at a time. There's one of these beetles, Lennon I think his name is, uh, I read a marvelous sentence of his, marvelous sentence. He says, life is something that happens to us while we're engaged in something else. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> Life is something that happens to us while we're busily engaged in something else. Worse, life is something that happens to us while we're busy suffering all sorts of other things. You know, I have a perfect image for this. You've got a concert hall. There's a symphony that's going on. Uh, the orchestra's playing. You've settled down nice and nicely and comfortably in your seat. Kind of the dark atmosphere and you're getting ready to, to hear the music and to enjoy it and then suddenly you remember that you forgot to lock your car. Oh gosh, what do you do now? You can't get out, it will be too disturbing. You cannot enjoy the music and you're caught in between. That is the image of life for most people. Constant anxiety. What do I do now? What's going to happen next? How do I cope with this? How do I deal with that? Oh, you seem to recognize that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mean, is another condition possible? It is. It is. It is. You know, what are you religious for? What is the use of your religion if it isn't giving you this? You got the dogmas right, you got the beliefs right, you got the ritual right, you got everything right, but your life is all wrong. What's the use of it? You got the menu, but you got no food to eat. What's the use of it? You got all the Lord, Lord right, but there's no life, huh? Why do you call me Lord, Lord and not do what I'm telling you? What's the use of it? If you don't know how to use it. So here goes, how does one use it? Let's begin with, you're upset. Remember we talked about upset this morning? You're upset because of your attachments. So let's begin concretely. If you remember nothing else from today except what I'm going to say in the next five minutes, that'll be worthwhile. You're upset. What is it that upset you? Somebody died, somebody betrayed you, Someone rejected you, you lost something, your plans have gone awry, something's gone astray, whatever. Can you think right now, even as I'm talking, of something that has upset you in the recent past? Go on, do it. I'm going to give you three or four seconds to do that. Think of something that has upset you in the recent past or is upsetting you right now. Then get your soul ready for a shock. Here it comes. 
I say it just like it is. I'm going to throw the lob the bomb right into your midst. midst. Listen to this. Nothing in reality, nothing in life, nothing in the world upsets you. Nothing has the power to upset you. Did anyone tell you that? All upset exists in you, not in reality. You could underline the word all. All of it, all of it, all of it. All upset is in you, not in life, not in reality, not in the world. It's in you. Uh, just understanding this has changed the lives of people, I mean, 180 degrees round. Just understanding this and no more. Reality is not upsetting. Reality is not problematic. If there were no human mind, there would be no problems. <laughs> All problems exist in the human mind. All problems are created by the mind. Somebody said to me in Denver last summer, wouldn't there be some problems that exist in reality and not in me? I said to him, if we take you out of there, where's the problem? No problem. Now to me, this is a truth so simple, a seven-year-old child could understand it. But I've met people, you know, who are doctors and, and all sorts of things, but they never, never understood it. Never understood it. They just took for granted that problems exist in the world. Problems exist, or by problem I mean something that upsets you, okay? I'll repeat that. By problem, I mean something that upsets you. They think it exists in the world. They think it exists in other people. They think it is in life. No, no, no. It's in them. As simple as that. Nothing has the power to upset you. Now I'll work that out concretely. Somebody broke their promise. Okay? You're upset. What do you think upset you? Broken promise? Mm -mm. Because I could bring another individual here in your place and she or he is faced with a broken problem, a, a broken promise and is not upset. How come you got upset? Now you choose to think, you were trained to think that was the broken promise that upset you. Wasn't the broken promise. It was your programming. It was your training. You've been trained to upset yourself every time you're faced with a broken promise. You're planning a picnic on Sunday and the picnic gets rained out. Where do you think the upset is? In the rain or in you? In the rain or in your reaction to the rain? I'll repeat that. The upset feeling is not caused by the rain, but by your reaction to the rain. Someone else would react differently, no upset. Of course, you can see that I'm building on this morning's statement. If you had not made your happiness depend on it's not raining, you wouldn't react this way, right? But you've been trained, you and I have been trained to make our happiness depend on certain things. And so when those things don't happen, thanks to our training, thanks to our programming, thanks to that false belief, if this doesn't happen, I'm not going to be happy. Well, what do you know? We, we upset ourselves. Some very interesting examples of this. Let me give you examples from other cultures. Huh? 
Last summer, a friend of mine here in New York told me a very interesting, uh, uh, gave me a little anthropological detail of a tribe in Africa. He said, you know, their method of awarding the death penalty is the following. They don't have any electrical chair, electric chair. They don't have death by hanging. They have death by banishment. So you belong to the tribe and uh, you have committed a capital offense and you're banished. And uh, this friend of mine said, when this, the sentence of banishment is read, within a week or so, the person dies. Would you die if somebody read a sentence of banishment on you? I wouldn't. I don't think you would either. Would you? What do you think? <laughs> I mean, we might feel it, right? I mean, we're banished to another place. We wouldn't die, for heaven's sake. They die, literally. The Jesuit friend of mine in Mexico who told me about a belief among the natives in one part of, of Mexico that if they touch a certain type of stone, they would die. They're quite convinced of this. So uh, there was a youngster who was running, it seems, and then his foot touched this kind of cursed stone. And the boy came to father and said uh, he was going to die. And father said, oh, that's superstition. I don't believe this. Well, that night, the boy's mother came to the priest and said, Father, would you please come with the last sacraments? And Father said, look, that's superstition. Don't you encourage that kid or he's going to really, you know, it's going to be a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. This is rubbish, etc., etc. So he didn't go. Well, the next morning, the kid had died. He had literally died. He was convinced of it, so he died. Uh, one hears of students in certain cultures, in certain communities in certain countries who take their examinations so seriously. I hope you don't take those blessed examinations of yours as seriously. <laughs> take them so seriously that if they fail, they, they commit suicide. I know people who fail and say, great, doesn't matter at all. And somebody else, suicide. Why the difference in reaction? Now, let's draw the conclusions. Who killed him? Who killed her? The examination? The failure? What do you think? Let's get some response. What, do, what would you say? Herself. Herself, her reaction, right? Her reaction. You could say about the, the guy who was banished there from that African tribe. Suppose I said to the judge, the banishment killed him. The banishment did not kill him. It was his belief, his culture, his indoctrination, his programming that killed him. Uh, the kid whose foot touched the stone, did the stone kill him? Oh, no, no. It was his belief, his programming. You got that much? Now we apply it to our daily, to daily life. And the application is devastating, explosive. It, you could explode into happiness forever. You really could. I'm going to get you to try it. I'll give you a, a little bit of a break and I'll give you an exercise on this and some of you are going to experience it right here in this room. Watch. Something has upset you. Did you hear that expression? Something has upset you? That's the way the English language is. That's the way all languages are. Something upset me. Nothing upsets you. The accurate way to speak would be I upset myself on the occasion of something. But who speaks like that? <laughs> so you upset me. No, no, no. Your behavior occasioned my upsetting myself. But we hate it, don't we? We love to make the world responsible, or people responsible, or life responsible, or God responsible. You did it. Not the upset. Not the upset. Uh, are you getting some inkling of what it would mean if you really grasped this? You'd be above it all. That's how, that's one nice definition of spirituality. Spirituality means to no longer be at the mercy of any event or any person or anything. Hey, I didn't say not to love people. I said you're not at their mercy anymore. 
you're no longer at the mercy of any event or of any person or of anything. In other words, no matter what happens, you no longer upset yourself. I was spending years, I mean, studying spirituality, writing about it, reading books on it, taking courses on it. But, hey, I want to see, are you still upset? Do you still upset yourself on the occasion? You do. What's the use of all your studies? Life is passing you by. While you're sitting in that concert hall, unable to enjoy the music, unable to lock the car caught in between. All right, now let's see if we could work this out concretely. If uh, you could give me two or three examples of upsetting, what we generally call upsetting situations or upsetting persons. If it were personal to you, that would be even better, but it doesn't have to be personal. huh? It could be uh, something that you've experienced, something that someone else has experienced. What's your name? Kathy? Mm -hmm. Kathleen? All right. Go ahead, Kathleen. All right. If someone died, so here's an example, okay? Someone dies and I'm upset. What upset me? The death of this person. No. If I'm upset by it, I've been programmed to be upset when someone dies. Now, Take your time for that. That goes against everything your culture and mine has taught us. We've been taught to upset ourselves when we lose somebody. We've been trained to upset ourselves when someone rejects us, disapproves of us, leaves us, dies on us. We've been here it goes, get ready for a scandalous sentence. We've been trained to depend emotionally on people. To not be able to live emotionally without people. I stress emotionally. So, well, naturally, I'm upset because someone I was attached to has died. The death upset me. Mm -mm. On the occasion of this, I have been trained to upset myself. It sounds almost blasphemous, huh? It's awful. Think it over. Let's get a couple of examples more. Yes. He doesn't have enough to eat. All right. Excellent. Oh, oh. Uh, okay, say it again. Seeing someone on the street who doesn't have enough to eat. Seeing someone on the street who doesn't have enough to eat. That's a great example because it seems like, look, we ought to be upset. Now, let me take that slowly, all right? I see someone on the street who doesn't have enough to eat. Is that an evil? What do you think? Yes or no? Yes, obviously. Ought I to do something about it in as much as I can? Yes or no? Good, great. So far, you're getting all the right answers. We're going to catch you. Watch out. Third, do I need to upset myself in order to swing into action and do something about it? Great. My, you're, 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 you're getting A's everywhere. You know, there's an assumption that if you don't upset yourself, if you don't train people to upset themselves, they're not going to do anything. But look, here's someone who doesn't have enough to eat, and that's a calamity. Now you've gone and upset yourself. We've got two calamities. <laughs> could, we, could we deal with this calamity without having another one added? But you know, lots of people cannot even conceive of their swinging into action without their first upsetting themselves. It's something like this. You're standing in a line. Somebody breaks the line. Uh, now look, you want to take action? That's fine. You want to say it's wrong? You're right. You want to do something about it? Do. You want to push him away? That's fine. But you know what you're doing? 
You're saying you've misbehaved, so I'm going to punish myself. Look how logical this is, okay? Because when I, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we say, I say to people, why do you have to get upset? They say that isn't human. It isn't human. Look what you're doing. He misbehaved, right? So good. So what you're going to do is raise your blood pressure, lose your peace of mind, miss your sleep tonight. Say, look, since you misbehaved, I'm going to... Uh, why, why would you punish yourself? You're innocent. But you think people would understand this? I mean, educated people, so-called reasonable people, their culture is built on this. How could you not upset yourself? You mean you're not upset? No. But you're planning to do something, evidently. Oh, yeah, very much so. <laughs> but you're not upset. No, why should I upset myself? Why should I punish myself? Because he misbehaved. Uh, plunge into the din of battle and keep your heart at, the, at peace at the lotus feet of the Lord. Get into the din of battle. But there's a fear, see? The people who trained us, the people who programmed us, feared that if we didn't upset ourselves, we wouldn't do anything. It never occurred to them to realize that when you upset yourself, you have less energy to do something and you have less perception. You're not seeing things right anymore. You're overreacting. I, I know nothing about boxing, but they tell me that the last thing a boxer in the ring ought to do is to get upset or lose his temper because then he's lost the match. And they tell me too that the first thing his opponent is trying to do is to get him to lose his temper. So then he loses coordination and perception. And uh, how often people who get into social projects, great projects for the welfare of others, they get so Im involved emotionally and so upset that they destroy the very work they set out to do. They lose perception. They overreact. One more example. Let's see. Any other example? Yes. Okay. Great. Give me your name. Maureen. The question is, suppose there's a crime done against you. Shouldn't you be upset about that? Uh, let's... I know, it's like your people have stolen something from you. Did you say your name is Maureen? Yeah. Maureen, we, we didn't say don't do anything about it. Okay. Ah, okay, all right, all right. Now, how about that? There's a crime done against you. Does that justify your now upsetting yourself, right? yes or no? Does it justify your upsetting yourself? No, no. But look, it, it seems almost unrealistic to even think in these terms. Now do you understand what I was saying this morning, that when you begin to talk to people, they don't want to hear. They say, oh, get away, you're crazy, you're mad, get away. <laughs> All right, bye. <laughs> Does this remind you of a gospel sentence? When they don't want to hear you, go away, go somewhere else. Don't waste your breath. They don't want to hear. They don't want to be happy. They don't want to change. All right, let them be. Why would you want to waste your breath? Do you have a need to give yourself the good feeling that you're converting everybody and the cause of their enlightenment? Maybe you ought to look into yourself now. You're not going to be happy unless you set yourself up as the great master, huh? See? They don't want to hear. Great. All right. That's their responsibility. So, every time Oh, let's, let's word it this way. Nothing in all of this world has the power to upset you. Nothing. As a matter of fact, nothing has ever upset you. Nobody has ever hurt you. How about that one? My, you're not going to like this. Oh, no. You mean nobody hurt me? I mean, uh, no, no one ever hurt you. You stupidly hurt yourself. Now that brings me to part two. Oh, they didn't hurt me, right? Reality didn't hurt me, right? So I cannot lash out against them. 
So who did the damage? Old me. Me hurt me? Yeah. And I'm going to lash out against me. I'm going to hate me for doing this. Are you getting what I'm saying? Why do I do this? I'm getting angry with me. I'm getting upset with me. What do you know now? Well, I got good news for you. They didn't do it to me. The world didn't do it to me. Life didn't do it to me. And best of all, I didn't do it to me. Isn't that wonderful? Then who done it? <laughs> Look, honest to goodness, would any of you in your right mind sit down and knowingly and willingly and deliberately upset yourselves? Come on. Do you think any of you would do that? No, we wouldn't. We're not going to upset ourselves deliberately. It's as if this is something beyond our control, right? So stop blaming yourself. This has been stamped into you. You've been programmed into this. You've been conditioned this way. This is what you've got to understand. You see, you don't have to do anything for enlightenment. You don't have to do anything for liberation and for spirituality. All you have to do is to see something understand something. If you would understand it, you'd be freed. So, I'm upset. I've upset myself. They did it to me. Wrong. I did it to me. Wrong. It's my programming that's doing it to me. It's the culture that's doing it to me. This is the way I've been brought up. This is the way I've been trained. That native in that part of Africa is banished. The sentence killed him. Wrong. He killed himself. Wrong. It was his programming that did it. So, we've been programmed this way. You know, one of the signs of maturity, my dears, is the following. Very hard to define maturity. But I've come up with a fairly workable definition. Maturity is when you no longer blame anyone. You don't blame others. You don't blame yourself. You see what's wrong and you set about remedying it. That's one pretty good sign of maturity. You know, you'd be amazed how childish people are. They're so childish. I mean, if you've seen a little child, as a matter of fact, you can almost take for granted that in its present state of lunacy, 99.999% of humanity is childish. Just hang around. Hang around for half a day. You'll find our greatest men and women indulging in acts of childishness. Utterly childish. You know the way a child behaves? A little kid, I don't know about here in the States, but in India, I mean, uh, they bump their knee into a, a, a table, and they're saying, wow, and everybody goes, who hit you? The table? Naughty table. Naughty table. I'm so, oh, table, naughty table. And then the kid's feeling good. See how childish that is? Huh? 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 So they're coming to you and say, now who hit you? My wife, my husband, my superior. Aren't they awful? They're terrible. And the little baby's feeling good. And he's the president of whatever big association or country or whatever. Oh my God, how, how childish can a, a person get? And they don't know their childishness. They got to blame somebody. But no. Maturity is to understand that no one is to blame. Or better still, more accurately put, not to give yourself the childish emotional outlet of blaming others or yourself, but rather seeing what went wrong and setting about remedying it. Do something about it. See? So, they're not to blame. You're not to blame. It's the programming that's doing this to you. 
Now, you're probably a bit too tired to do any exercise or anything, but I'm still going to offer you one. It'll only take a couple of minutes. Uh, see if it has any effect on you. Think of something that till now you would have said has upset you. I told you to think about it a little while ago. Go back to that. And understand that it wasn't that thing or that person that upset you. It was your programming. It was your programming. It wasn't their meanness. It wasn't their disapproval. It wasn't their rejection. It wasn't the failure. It was your programming that upset you. And see what happens to you. My, if anyone would, would uh, summon up the courage to tell us what happened to him or her, that would be splendid. Anyone wants to tell us uh, if you had any success doing it and what happened to you? Okay, would you come up here, please, uh, Chris? Great. Would you stand up, please? Yes. I would it seem, seem like your whole culture has told you to feel upset in that situation. To All take right. that away leaves you feeling like you're lost. All right. So you react with a feeling of, gee, I'm lost. Something like that. Somebody else had a hand up here. Oh, okay. All right. You've made me realize something really, really incredible. Okay. That, um, until now, I have always identified with what I've felt. Okay. And now I know that I am not my feeling. I am not my unhappiness. I am not my pleasure. Good. It will go away. Great. So you were able to distance yourself from the unhappiness, yeah. right? And say, so, well, it'll go away. All right. How about you? Um, my response is similar. You'd have to, it comes to a point where you have to let go of it. All right. And not, and realize that you are the one that has the power, not the thing over you. Okay, a similar response. It's like, you're the one who have to let go of it, did you say? Okay. Look, when you're able to do this repeatedly, again and again, the general universal experience is the following. Gee, this thing upset me. First step. Second step, uh-uh, it wasn't this thing that upset me. It was my programming that upset me. Oh, so I don't have to deploy all of my energies fighting that outside thing, right? All right, right. I don't have to spend all my emotional energies blaming that outside thing. That's right. Funny, this thing gets, gets depleted. It keeps going down. You know, because as long as I've got an enemy out there who's upsetting me, I'm demanding that that change. I'm refusing to give up my upset unless that thing change. Am I clear enough? Like if I think, would you give me your name? PJ. PJ. Now if I think PJ is upsetting me, then as long as he's there and he's indulging in the behavior which I say is upsetting me, I'm refusing to give up my upset unless he reform, he change, he disappear, he get away or whatever. Right? But let's suppose PJ refuses to get away. Let's suppose it isn't PJ but it's life and life persists in being that way. So I continue to be upset. Now the moment I say, hey wait a minute, it isn't PJ, it isn't life, it's my programming. Oh is that what it is? That's right. You know he could be right there doing exactly what he's doing now and I needn't be upset. Other people in my position wouldn't be upset. It's my programming. Oh, that's a revelation. And the upset 
is going down, 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 down. And after a while, you're getting less and less upset about fewer and fewer things. Am I clear enough? Am I? Okay. Now comes the big, pardon me, huh? I don't mean to be insulting or anything, but you're going to enjoy this. Now comes the big American question. How do we fix it? <laughs> like, okay, he's not upsetting me. I'm not upsetting me. The programming is upsetting me. How do I fix this? You know the big oriental answer? You don't fix it. You let it be. It'll go away. The more you try to fix it, the stronger it gets. Gee, that's another mind-blowing thing. Don't fix it. Let it be. Let it be. It'll go away. It really will. If you've seen this, if you've seen... But don't I need to know where this programming comes from? It's a help. It's a help, but not necessary. And if you're hell-bent on getting it, I've got to find it out where it comes from, and I've got to change it, you're going to make it worse. You can be sure of that. Lots of people never change because they're so determined to change. They're so determined that they never change. They're so tense, they're so anxious that it gets worse. So here's another thing that particularly people in the West and in the East were all the same. You know the kind of stuff I give you here. I give in Japan and I give in India and I give in Spain and Latin America and everywhere and everywhere the people are the same. You've got a thin veneer of culture that's different but deep down we're all the same. Same problems everywhere. The hatred is the same. The conflict is the same. The guilt is the same. The, the dependence on people's opinion and on the emotional dependence on approval is the same. It's exactly the same. Just scrape off the, the exterior culture and we're all the same. Now, everywhere people are trying to fix it too. H how do I change it? You don't change it. You understand it. You look at it. You observe it. It'll take care of itself. Then what happens is you don't change it. Life changes it. Nature changes it. The way you don't heal yourself, nature heals itself. You just do something to aid nature. So let me wrap this up and we take a, a kind of a seven minute break to field questions in case I've not been clear enough. And to aid the questions, I'll make it a little more outrageous, okay? I'll make it a bit more outrageous. When something happens, that we commonly say upsets you, it isn't this thing that upsets you. Life is not rough on you. Life is easy. It's your programming that is rough on you. Life is easy. Life is delightful. Think of my friend Ram Chandra, the rickshaw puller. <laughs> All right, so it isn't this thing outside there that's causing the upset. It isn't you that are causing the upset. It's your programming. You got people you're living with. You're having difficulty in human relations. Human relations are never difficult. It's your programming that's difficult. There are never any difficulties in relating to people. There are only difficulties in your programming. How come you're getting upset? You mean it's possible to live with a guy who's losing his temper every day and not get upset? Yes, yes, very much so. Not be upset. You mean when somebody insults you, you're not getting upset? That's right, why not? Why not not be upset when someone insults you? I mean, when the letter isn't received, it's sent back to the, uh, to the man who wrote it or the woman who wrote it. You don't receive it, it goes back. How come you received it? Do you know why you got insu in, uh, insulted or why you were upset by the insult? Because you took it, that's why. Silly. <laughs> why did you take it? You mean it's possible not to take it? You mean you call this being human, living like a little monkey? Anyone pulls a string and you jump? I'll tell you what it means to be human. You know what it means to be human is 
uh, it's something like this. A guy goes and buys a newspaper every day from a newspaper vendor. The newspaper vendor is always rude to him. So a friend of his says, why do you buy your paper from this guy? He's always rude to you. Why don't you buy it from someone else just next door? Says this guy, why should the vendor decide where I buy my newspaper? Why should he have the power to decide that? Now you're talking about a human being. Otherwise, you're talking about monkeys. You could control them. Just twist their tail a little and they, they act in predictable ways. Programming. Programming. So it isn't the person who has upset you. It isn't you who have upset yourself. It's your programming. All you have to do is understand this and distance yourself from it. Understand it. You want to do something about that programming if you can? Fine. Is it necessary? No. If you're understanding it, you know it comes from your programming, not from you, not from them. It'll take care of itself. It really will. You'll be amazed that after a few months, things that before would have made you sick with anxiety or with suffering or with, with whatever, you can take in your stride with perfect peace. You're quite relaxed about it. That's the spiritual life. That's dying to yourself, dropping that programming. You drop it by understanding it for what it is. Call it by its name. All right, we have a couple of calls. I think Scranton's on the line. So we'd... Hello, Tony. Okay, yes. This is Jane Mascaro. Oh, well, welcome, Jane. from the University of Scranton. Great. And in Pennsylvania. Uh-huh. Three questions. First... In the world you described, is it possible to sin? The second, do we liberate ourselves or does Christ's grace free us? And the third, may I not take action, even though I am not upset, at an injustice I see? If somebody jumps in line ahead of me, I'm not going to let them upset me. May I take action? Great. Okay. Thanks, Jane. So here we go. We'll begin backwards. When somebody jumps into the line ahead of me, may I not take action? Oh, no. Go right ahead and take action. Take all the action you want. Okay? Yes. It's okay. The point is, you're, not take, you're taking action to right a wrong. You're not taking action to relieve an upset feeling. You see the difference? That's the big difference. So go ahead and take and uh, take action, but you're taking action to right something that was wrong. I'm sorry to say frequently, we're taking action not only to right something which is wrong, but to, uh, to relieve upset feelings. That's bad. Secondly, is it possible to sin in this world that we're talking about? Of course. There's so much sin around us. There's so much evil around us. However, when the more you understand human nature, the less inclined you feel to judge anyone. Because there's so much stupidity, so much ignorance, so much fear, and so much programming behind so much of what we call sin that we've been rightly advised to judge no one. No one. Not even ourselves. Paul says that. Even he doesn't dare to judge himself. And thirdly, is it we who liberate ourselves or is it Christ's grace? Christ's grace is available to everybody. But you know, having Christ's grace available to you doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get anywhere. You've got to do something. Remember the story of that guy who uh, lit his pipe and burnt his beard and they said, You burnt your beard! He said, I know, but can't you see I'm praying for rain? Well, yes, I mean, the rain is available, but you better do something. So the idea is, unfortunately, God's grace is available to everyone. The tragedy of the human race is not that there's a shortage of God's grace. It's that there's a shortage of proper understanding. We got wrong ideas that need to be corrected. 
All right, so that much for your question. So much for your questions, Jane. Let's get somebody else. Isn't this fun getting people calling from all parts of the states? Okay, you're on the line. Hello. Hello. Yes, Father. Um, this is Pat Jeremiah from Jacksonville University. Would you give me your name again, please? Pat Jeremiah. Je Pat. Yes, Pat. We're, okay, Pat, I got it. You have a great deal of education and travel in your background. Uh -huh. And while these are not necessary for the Enlightenment as you define it, I wonder if you could comment on how they prepare you as steps of growth to be ready to accept the truth that you speak of. Okay. Thanks, Pat. Thank you. Thanks for calling. Well, does an educational background prepare you for this sort of thing? No! You need common sense and intelligence, which has nothing to do with erudition, literacy, or learning of any sort, period. Don't you get away with the thought that a PhD is better equipped than a simple illiterate peasant in the Andes. Not for this, not for this. You'd be amazed at how little intelligence learned people have. You really would. You really would. I mean it. You've got to deal with them. You know, yesterday, a friend of mine at Fordham University was telling me that uh, he read an extraordinary book about the people who sent some of these spaceships, these rockets, out to the moon and stuff. From their own confessions and interviews and stuff, they said, you know, it's tragic that we were to, able to produce all of this co cooperation to send a rocket onto the moon, but we can't cooperate with our families. We don't know how to do it. We don't know how to get on with our wives and husbands. We See what I mean? You see what I mean? And I've run into peasants who know how to do it. How about that? That is intelligence. So learning isn't the same as intelligence at all. You can have a lot of learning and no awareness of yourself at all. You could know how spaceships function and you wouldn't know how you yourself function. No great help. For this, what is needed is not an educational background, but wisdom understanding, intelligence, which is acquired by what I said to you this morning. Cutting, scraping, melting, questioning, doubting. If you never question, if you never doubt what they taught you, you never doubt what your culture gave you, how would you understand all of this? All right, let's get another call. Yes, you're on the line. Welcome to the show. Hello, Father. Yes? Yes, this is Michael Uwe from the Catholic Chapel in Newman Center at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Great. Thanks for calling, Michael. Let's have the question. Okay. I've got two questions for you here. Uh-huh. Um, the first question, I'd like you to relate your concept of happiness and what it is to be human to God. And in the second question, I'd like you to clarify something on detachment for us. Um, first of all, now you said that our desire is what chains us. What about our desire for God? And is God to be found in desirelessness? And moreover, could we equate God with desirelessness? Okay. And then the second one is, what about the person who is being physically abused in a home? How can he detach himself from that? Would you say that again, please, Michael? I didn't get that. The second one? About the person who is being physically abused at home. Yes. That person attempt to detach himself. All right. Okay, let's begin with the second one. Thanks, Michael. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We'll begin with the second one, which is more difficult. Obviously, a person who's being physically attacked at home is going to find it much more difficult not to be upset than someone who contemplates the, the world scene from his window, okay? Look, I'm not saying this is easy. I'm saying it's possible. And I'm saying, if you think it's impossible, you're never going to get there. Is it possible that people would be tortured and at peace? Yes! I've seen instances of this. Read an extraordinary letter from, uh, written by a prisoner in Nazi Germany who was tortured every day. And you know, he knows he's going to be executed. The most sublime and lovely letters that he wrote to his family, I read those letters, I said, 
how would this be possible? I read this about 20 years ago, see. I know now it is possible. But let's make a beginning. A journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. Let's deal with the guy who breaks into the line. Let's deal with the woman who's always nagging you or with the man who's always insulting you. Let's begin there. And as I said, they're not causing the upset. It's coming from your programming. You're not causing the upset. It's coming from your programming. Give it a try. Get started. See what it does to you. When you can understand this. Again, remember, I'm not saying that this would mean you're not identifying wrong when you see wrong. I'm not saying that this does, means that you're not going to take action. You are. But you're seeing where the upset is coming from. Is that uh, clear enough? All right, let's move on to the next one then. Uh, was there an... Oh, pardon me. Uh, was there one which I forgot? Yes. Uh, which was that? Oh, the desirelessness. Michael, you'd have to be patient with me. I'll deal with the desirelessness soon. Okay, uh, you're on the line. I pressed the button al already. Uh, would you identify yourself? Hi, my name is Joyce, and I'm calling from Georgetown University. Great. Would you give us your name again, please? Joyce. Joyce. Yes, Joyce. Okay, my question is, does true happiness come from a within a humanly desire and control for happiness, or does it come from a soul desire to know God and to know Jesus Christ? Okay. Very good. We could tie in. Thanks, Joyce. We could tie in your question with the one of Michael. Uh, the desire for God. Now, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas, the prince of Catholic theologians, at least was unanimously considered the prince of Catholic theologians till quite recently, says, <laughs> Oh, you're, you're pretty sophisticated theologically, I can see that. Uh, says, in the introduction to his great Summa Theologica, he says, about God we can say this much with certainty, that we do not know what he is. God is beyond the knowing mind, which is why we call him mystery. How does one desire what one cannot and not even conceive? what one speaks of in symbolical, analogical terms. So you see, when we talk about desiring God, we don't talk of God as an object out there, as a person out there that we can fully conceive or understand. And so that doesn't fall in to what I'm talking about. Because you're desiring you know not what. So, frequently people, when they talk about desiring God, will set up some kind of an image and begin to desire that image frequently. But to desire the unknown, the unknowable, that which is beyond all human conception and understanding, the mysterion, the mystery. What does that mean? We have no idea. So as Michael said pretty well, could we equate that with desirelessness? Maybe, maybe not. But for heaven's sake, don't get distracted by this now. Get on with the task. We could have all kinds of theological discussions about the other thing, but in the meantime, Get on with the task. Get on with self-observation, self-awareness, self-understanding, self-liberation. Then you will understand better, beyond understanding, as St. Paul says, what God is. Well, I'm not too sure that's much clearer than when we began. But don't forget we're talking about God. Look, let me tell you a, a powerful little story which will illustrate what I'm saying. Everywhere I go, I find people fighting about God. I find people killing one another in the name of God. You're obviously not killing one another in the name of God, but the God they think they know, right? Well, I'm sorry I'm going to have to disappoint you. We've got five calls waiting. Let's go 
take the calls first, then I tell you the story. All right? Let's, uh, all right, you're on the line. Hi, my name's Jeff, and I'm calling from the University of Texas at El Paso. Yes, Jeff, thanks for calling. That, would you have a question for us? Yes, we, uh, we have two questions we'd like to ask. The first one is, um, it's concerning the uh, blaming the programming. That's right. Okay, uh, how can we obtain maturity if we blame the programming? Is uh -huh. that being immature because we're putting the blame on the programming? Okay. That lead to things like the devil made me do it or I'm a victim of society. In other words, oh, yeah, evading okay. the responsibility. That's right, okay. And is that all, uh, Jeff? The, the second question is, okay. uh, uh, what is your concept of sin in the role of Jesus being the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world? Okay, thank you. Let's begin with the second. Look, I'd much rather not get into great theological discussions now on the Christian dogma and scripture. See, that would take us too far afield. So, with the second one, I'd rather leave it aside because these are beautiful symbolical expressions to express a deep reality. But where's the time to develop all of that in the brief space of one day? Okay. Now, about the blaming. Do you blame your programming? No, you don't blame your programming. You understand. Now, it's like saying, you blame the devil. Poor devil, I mean, we're blaming the devil. As <laughs> Jeff says very well, you're not taking responsibility. Great. Take responsibility, but one must take responsibility wisely, okay? Remember how I said the upset is not in reality, it's in you? Remember that? Don't keep blaming reality, it's in you. But shall I blame myself? But hey, you haven't done it. And it's no maturity to blame yourself when you're not to blame. You're not doing it deliberately. This comes from your programming. So that's what I mean. You're not blaming your programming, you're understanding that's that, that that's where it comes from. When you bump your knee into a table, you must understand that the pain is not in the table. The pain is caused by something that's happening in your knee. Something's happening in your knee and that causes the pain. The pain is not in the table. Now when you bump into reality, there's a pain caused within you. That pain is not caused by reality, but something that's happening inside of you. You're not producing that deliberately. Who would deliberately want to cause pain to themselves? Now you have to understand what that something is. Why is it that with some people, this process doesn't go on, or they've released themselves from it, whereas with others it does? This is responsibility, to understand and as a result of understanding, to be freed from it. Okay, let's take another question. Yes, you're on the line. Yes, this is Nancy Nelson from the University of Colorado in Boulder. Yes, Nancy. Yes, all right, and I'm up in Estes Park with 150 other students from the Rocky Mountain College student group. Gee, that's tremendous, Nancy. That's very heartening. And um, I have a question that was referred to earlier about the victims of violent crime. Yes. Now, I feel that painful emotions and a lot of confusion and isolation is brought about by a situation like this. Yes. And by having the idea that you mustn't be upset in a situation like this, I feel it's a very uncompassionate view towards people. All right. I'd like to know how you would be able to cope with dealing with someone who is not at your level and how it would be the best way to approach a person like this and show an empathetic view. Okay, thanks, Nancy. Thanks. Uh, what Nancy says is so right. You know, if when someone comes to you and is all upset about, uh, let's say, she or he is a victim of crime, and they're all upset, or let's say uh, someone's mother has died and is full of grief, now you don't take the attitude of, oh, you're grieving, you're upset, there's something wrong with, oh, no, 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 no. You understand. <laughs> Look, this poor person, even if the grief, or if the grief comes from an attachment, if the pain, the isolation comes from an attack, this poor person isn't causing it. Have you understood that? Have you understood me to say that? They're not causing it. 
we could sympathize with them, we could understand them, we can be compassionate with them, and gently, when they're ready, explain where it's coming from. Because ultimately, we're not being compassionate if we don't give them the secret someday or other. Am I clear enough there? Like, see, you've come to me and you're very upset because someone has injured you. Well, I'll understand you. I'll understand where you're coming from. I'll be compassionate towards you. But someday, sometime, somewhere, if you're ready, I'll slip you the secret. That to me would be true compassion. You don't have to be this way. There's another way. Okay, one more question. Welcome to the show. You're on the line. Would you identify yourself? My name is Valerie Nunez. Yes, um, Valerie. I'm calling from the Catholic Diocese of Brownsville. Uh huh. Um, my question is dealing with the um, the matter of upsetness. Yes. Say so that um, it's not the, the um, people around us that have upset us. It's not ourselves, but it's our program. Um, is it not the people that were around us that have programmed us when, when we were young? Okay, that's pretty good. Yes, all right, Valerie. Thank you. It's like, isn't it the people around us who have programmed us when we were young? They have. But poor dears, they didn't set out with any malice to do this to us. They're the victims of what other people had done to them. You understand? So we're not swearing at them. We're not yelling at them. Again and again, I get people come to me who are so upset about their parents. They can't forgive their parents. They hate their parents. All right, I understand. I'm not saying that your parents did right or they did wrong. Maybe they did wrong. All right. But look, could you understand them? Because that's what love is all about, see? Love is not blaming others. Love is not judging others. Love is not condemning others. Love is understanding. Can you understand where they came from? Can you understand how there's so little malice there and so much ignorance and so much goodwill and so much helplessness and so much programming and so much confusion and so much fear? Have you ever paused to understand this? Oh, then you'll understand what it means to love. That'll change you too. Okay, any more calls? Uh, Hello. Hello, you're on the line. Hello, Tony. Yes. This is John Mergenhagen. Yes, hello, John. Agra. Good to hear from you again. You, you have a me, question Tony. for us. Yes, do you have a question for us, John? Right, I do. Okay. My question is this. I understand now that, uh, that hap my happiness does not consist in, um, or my happiness consists in being free of attachments and desires. I understand that Jesus himself could experience fears and hurts and anger, but still not lose that lotus place with the Father. But my problem now is, I also believe that my happiness does not consist in a very passive human existence where I would become an unfeeling zombie. That I feel that somehow in the middle is a passion and an enthusiasm and a zeal that Jesus himself had without it becoming an attachment. So I'd like you to say something about passion and enthusiasm and zeal when it's not an attachment. Well, all I can say, John, is amen to what you've said. Amen. I agree with that. Thanks, John. Remember what I said about the archer? Huh? When there is no tension and there is no upset, all of the forces within you are unleashed. Uh, and uh, now you will understand what true joy is. Now you will understand what true enthusiasm is. Now you will understand what it means to plunge into life with heart and soul, what John would call passion. Get right into it, surely. Because you're no longer stabbing yourself with these uh, programmed emotions. Any more? Let's take a couple of questions from here. Anyone would like to ask something? All right. Would you stand up, please? And Yes, uh, my name is Peter Butler. I'm from Fordham University. Yes, Peter. Uh, I have a problem um, going along with the idea that that we've been programmed to be upset. It would Good. seem to me by looking at like, very young children who haven't been programmed yet with anything, uh, that 
they're naturally upset and that we need programming to to teach people how to overcome upsetness. All right, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, what Peter says is when you study young children, you see that they're naturally upset. They don't need any particular programming to be upset. Okay. First, you have a point there, Peter. You see, little children become upset when they don't get something which they think is vital to them and which is necessary for their happiness. See, then you know the way after a while they forget all about it or they grow up and they don't care for it. Ah, so cause number one, you picked up an attachment desire, as I said this morning. But for the rest, little children, you know, you don't tell a little child that it's a horrible thing not to be approved by people. Couldn't care less. You don't tell a little child that, uh, you know, when somebody laughs at you, it's terrible. You could laugh at a child, ha, 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 the child laughs back. <laughs> That's what I've got to, going to deal with in the, the last session. The drug, the drug, the drug, the control. When you're two years old, if they teach you, you know, when they do this, you're supposed to feel good. And when they say, ha, oh, you're supposed to feel bad. And you swallow that, you're finished. The programming has begun. One more question from the hall, then we have two more calls waiting and then we end. All right, would you come up here, please? Uh, My name is Eileen. I'm from Fordham University also. Yes, I Eileen. just wanted to go back on the point you made where something doesn't upset you. What about in a case with like a prisoner of war or someone who's got a, like AIDS or terminally ill disease, there's really nothing that you can do for them, but you still feel upset for them. How are you supposed to get around not feeling upset for, about this person? Okay, Eileen, that's, that's pretty good. Look, I put it this way. Take the case of the person who uh, was told he had AIDS and he only had six months to live and was perfectly serene. Now, you wouldn't want to be upset when he's serene, right? Okay. All right, and then let's suppose there's someone who's not serene, but who's upset. And I'd say, gee, uh, if you've contemplated life and you know it's coming to an end and it has to come to an end, if instead of reading so many books, we spend more time looking out, out the window, like this gorgeous thing you have here in the States and in the West, uh, the seasons, and you see those, those leaves falling and changing, how much that tells you about life. When you've understood that and you understand the flow of life, well, he's upset. You're not going to help him by being upset yourself. Does it make sense? Okay, great. Let's take the last two calls and then we'll end the session. Uh, all right, you're on the line. Hello, Father. This is Marshall Whitaker from the University of Dayton. Yes, Marshall. We have three questions if you can answer them all. Uh-huh. The first one is, uh, how would your, what you're saying attack suffering with the way we cause others deliberately to suffer? Uh-huh. If we, if we deliberately do something so someone else would suffer. Okay. Uh, let's deal with those questions quickly, Marsha, because we, we're running out of time. Do we ever deliberately cause someone to suffer? Now, I'm going to do this very briefly, okay? It probably require an hour, so I hope I don't get misunderstood. But all the same, I'm going to take the risk and say it. When you do damage to someone, you know the first person you're damaging is yourself. Does this make sense? When you nurture hatred for someone, the one you're damaging the first is yourself, right? Now, who does this sort of thing? Crazy people. Who buys a brand new watch for $3,000 and puts sand in it? Crazy people. Who sits down to a meal and puts powdered glass in the meal to destroy themselves? Crazy people. Crazy people commit sins. They are the elves. So, uh, all right, Marsha, how about the second thing? The second question. Are you still on the line, Marsha? Hello, Marsha? Uh, this is yes. Scott Frock. I'm from the Archbishop Sheen 
uh, Catholic Communication Center in Dallas. Yes, Scott. Um, first question I'd like to ask is, how would you comment on someone who seems to have a kind of behavior that just seems to have com complete control over them? And secondly, uh, could you relate that to how Paul says that he does he does things that he doesn't want to do, and the things that he really does want to do, he can't do? Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh huh. Okay. All right. Thanks, Scott. Let's deal with the first one. You know, people who have to seem to have complete control of themselves through hardening themselves, not allowing themselves to feel. Do you see the difference between this and what I've been saying to you today? Look, we've got two kinds of people. People who refuse to let themselves feel anything at all. They sort of harden themselves and they say, I'm not going to care, I'm not going to care, I don't care at all. That's one extreme. So they've hardened themselves, that's no great help. Now, the, the kind of person I'm talking about is the person who is upset, but through understanding transcends it, G go, gets over it, right? All right, and as for Paul saying he does things that he doesn't want to do, etc., he does say, who will get me out of this? The grace of Christ will get me out of it. Now, the grace of Christ comes through so many ways. You must not understand the grace of Christ as being some substance that is poured into you. When you come to a deeper understanding of reality, is that not the grace of Christ? When you understand yourself better, is that not the grace of Christ? So there it is. So here we go. <laughs> During the interval, I was thinking about those questions on religion, something very briefly on religion, and that, that story I promised you, remember? And then we were interrupted by the calls. There's this guy who invented fire, the art of making fire, see? And so then uh, he takes the tools for making fire and goes up to the north where they have these tribes shivering in the cold. And he teaches them the art of making fire and the advantages. And people become interested. They learn. And what do you know? Pretty soon they're cooking. They're using it for building. And before they had time to say thanks to the inventor, he had disappeared. He didn't want any thanks. He just wanted people to benefit from his invention. He goes to another tribe. And he attempts to interest them too in his new invention. But he ran into a snag there, see? The priests began to realize how popular the guy was becoming and how their own influence on the people was, dim was diminishing. So they decided to make away with him. They poisoned him. A suspicion arose among the people that it was the priests who had done it. So you know what the priests did? They had a huge portrait made of the man. They put it on the main altar in the temple. They devised a liturgy by which the man would be honored, a ritual. And year after year, people came to pay homage to the great inventor and to the instruments for making fire. And the ritual was faithfully observed. But there was no fire. No fire. Ritual. Remembrance. Gratitude. Veneration. No fire. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and fail to do what I tell you? What's he telling us? Love. Love. That's what he's saying. What's the major obstacle to love? What I've been talking about today. Our programming. Our obsessive attachments. That's what's blocking it, as I hope to show you during this session. The best religion in the world is the religion called love, not the religion called Lord, Lord.
Who says that? Jesus Christ himself. And we may never lose sight of that, we Christians. Talking about this matter of grace and our effort, etc. <laughs> There's the one, the lovely one of the, the pious old Jew who said one day to God, he said, God, look how faithfully I've served you all my life. Right? Of course, he heard no answer. Right, says he himself to himself. Now, I've never asked you for anything. Right? Right, says he, talking on behalf of God, of course. <laughs> and he says, now I'm going to ask you for just one favor and you can't say no to me. All my life I've served you, I've observed the law, I've kept the rights, I've done good to people, I've observed your commandments. Just do me this one favor. Let me win the lottery and then I can retire in peace and security. So he was convinced that God would grant him his desire. And he waited and waited and waited and he kept on praying every night and after six months nothing had happened. And one night in sheer frustration he yelled, he said, God, give me a break, let me win the lottery. And imagine the fright he got when he heard a voice reply, give me a break yourself, buy a ticket. <laughs> I bought a ticket. So that much for effort and grace, buy your ticket, okay? Make sure you got your ticket. Make sure you're using your understanding. Don't expect miracles to happen. Like, you know, see, understand, change as a result of that. So the first thing has to do with religion. The second point I want to make before we end uh, this afternoon has to do with happiness. I'm going to tell you one of my favorite stories. You know, sometimes a story says more than a whole day's lecture because it, it sort of speaks to the depths within us. And this one certainly speaks to mine. This is a story of a guy who is moving out of the village in India, out of his village, and he sees what we in India call a sannyasi. The sannyasi is the wandering mendicant. The sannyasi is the person who, having attained enlightenment, understands that the whole world is his home and the sky is his roof and God is his father and will look after him. So he moves from place to place the way you and I would move from one room of our home to another. Well, here was this wandering sannyasi and the villager, when he meets him, he said, I cannot believe this. And the sannyasi says, what is it you cannot believe? And the villager says, I had a dream about you last night. I dreamt that the Lord Vishnu said to me, tomorrow morning you'll leave the village around 11 o'clock and you'll run into this wandering sannyasi. And here I've met you. What else did the Lord Vishnu say to you, said the sannyasi. And the man said, he said to me, if the man gives you a precious stone he has, you will be the richest man in the whole world. Would you give me the stone? So the sannyasi said, wait a minute. He rummages in his little sack, uh, knapsack that he had. He said, would this be the stone you're talking about? And the man couldn't believe his eyes because it was a diamond, the largest diamond in the world. He held it in his hands, he said, could I have this? And the sannyasi said, of course, you could take it. I found it in a forest. You're welcome to it. And he went on and sat under a tree in the outskirts of the village. The man grasped this diamond and how great was his joy. The way ours is, isn't it, the day we really get something we really want? Do you ever stop to ask how long it lasts? You got the girl you wanted, right? You got the boy you wanted, right? You got that car, huh? You got the degree. You were first in the university. How long did the joy last? Let's measure it. <laughs> I mean that. How many seconds? How many minutes? You get tired of it, don't you? Then you're looking for something else, aren't you? Why don't we study this? 
as valuable, more valuable than studying the scriptures because of what good is it to you to study the scriptures and crucify the Messiah on the basis of them as Jesus was if you've not understood this, if you've not understood what it means to live and to be free and to be spiritual. Well, so the guy has the diamond and then uh, instead of going home, he sits under a tree himself. And all day he sits, immersed in thought. And towards evening, he goes to the tree where the sannyasi is sitting, gives him back the diamond, and he says, Could you do me a favor? What? says the sannyasi. He said, Could you give me the riches that makes it possible for you to give this thing away so easily? Boy, I love that story. I love that story. Could you give me the riches that makes it possible for you to give this away so easily? That is what I've been talking about today. The world is full of sorrow. The root of sorrow is attachment. The uprooting of sorrow is the dropping of attachment. The understanding that attachment is a false belief. The false belief that any thing or person can make you happy. True happiness is caused by nothing. True happiness is uncaused. If you ask the mystic why he or she is happy, the answer will be, why not? No block, no obstruction. Why not? Have you ever thought that if something causes your happiness, when you lose that something, your happiness will be destroyed? Has it ever occurred to you that if something causes your happiness, you will become possessive of that thing? You will become anxious lest you lose it? Whatever that thing be, learning, reputation, good health, life itself. How interesting the rediscovery of life. You will never live till you stop clinging to life. Let go. When you cling, happiness dies. If your happiness depends on anyone or anything, that's not happiness, my dears. That's anxiety. That's tension. That's pressure. That's fear. The Japanese have a powerful tale for this. Oh, it's so powerful. There's this guy who's running away from a tiger, comes to a precipice, and quite unwittingly, he, he begins to slide down that precipice. And as he's sliding, he grabs hold onto a branch of a tree that's growing there, a kind of a bush. And then he looks down. There's no way of climbing up. And anyway, there's the tiger waiting from, for him there. And if he slides down, he slides down to his death, 15,000 feet. What does he do? He, he has a few minutes to live. Well, he looks at that bush he's holding on to, and he finds it's a berry bush. And he's holding on to it with one hand, and he plucks the berry bush, the, a berry from the bush with the other, puts it into his mouth, and tastes it. And the story goes, and it tasted so sweet. Isn't that marvelous? I know friends of mine in the past, two of them at different intervals, who were dying and who said to me, I began to truly taste life and see how sweet it was when I let go. And I realized that life is ending. It was then that it began to taste sweet. 
So paradoxically, we're doing all the wrong things to be, un, uh, to be happy. We're doing, we've been programmed to be unhappy. Anything we're doing is going to make us more unhappy. Because anything you do to become happy is going to make you more unhappy. Because what are you going to do? You're going to change yourself, you're going to change others, you're going to acquire something, you're going to... You don't have to do anything. You have to understand. Drop the obstruction. Drop the false belief. And the attachment will drop, then you'll know what happiness is. That's so easily said. If you would meditate on that for days, and you would experience some of its truth, then you don't need to listen to me or to anyone else. You have it. You've learnt it. You've seen it. You're attached only because you falsely believe that without this thing or person or situation or event, you will not be happy. You falsely believe that. See its falseness and you will be free. How simple. And here we are scouring the earth, running everywhere in search of it. We had it right here at home and did not understand it. And we listened to all kinds of sermons and we studied all kinds of books and we went to all kinds of churches and but we never heard it. We never recognized the Messiah. He was right there. It was right there staring at us <laughs> right under our nose. We didn't see it. All right, I trust that some of you will. Some of you won't, maybe, but uh, maybe some of you will. That much for happiness. That was point two. The first had to do with religion, the second with happiness, the third with human relations. Let's wrap that up. You having trouble with people? You find somebody selfish, moody, unreliable, rejecting, stupid, intolerable, irresponsible, you name it. Think of troubles you have with human relations. You know the root of all those problems? <laughs> Hold on to your chairs. You. They, no, you, you. You're having trouble? You're the cause. <laughs> How come you're affected? You know, people come to me and say, and say, sorry to say it doesn't make for much practice where a counselor or a spiritual director is concerned, but who wants much practice? I mean, if the pig doesn't want to learn to sing, let him go somewhere else, see? It's say, uh, he, do you want to change? Hey, wait a minute, you didn't understand me. He, do you want to change? But. Look, there's something wrong with you. You're upset, right? Right. Do you want to change? No! Bye! <laughs> Go somewhere else. I don't have anything to offer you. I really don't. I really don't. You know what you're doing? You're coming to me and you're saying, Doctor, I've got stomach cramps. It's awful. It really is awful. Then I, as your doctor, am saying, you know, I'll prescribe something for your wife, okay? Okay? And you're saying, gee, that already makes me feel better, doctor. Thanks, thanks. Isn't that crazy? You're having trouble with your wife and you want me to change her? Who's having the trouble? You, right? We'll remove the trouble, the cause of the trouble, you. But they don't understand this. They've been brought up to think that everybody else has to change and the whole world has to change for them to be happy. So they don't understand it. If you're upset, there's something wrong with you. Let's clean that up first. But you mean she's not wrong? She is wrong. You mean she shouldn't change? Of course she should. But you're not the guy who's going to change her, you know, because you need change first. How about our taking the beam out of your eye, then you could take the speck out of hers, huh? Huh? How about you are taking the beam out of your eye, then you could take the speck out of the community's eye, out of your family's eye, or whatever. You're upset. Something wrong with you. You're not even seeing her. 
You know why? Because when you're upset, your telescope is out of focus. When you're upset, your window is blurred. And fool that you are, you're going now to straighten out all the buildings because your window is blurred with the rain. So you've got to straighten out the buildings. Could we clean your window first? We've got to straighten out the... Could we clean your window? That's what I'm attempting to do for you. Clean the window. Then we'll know what needs to be done and what doesn't need to be done. We see people not as they are, but as we are. And it's amazing, you know, how in the beginning we saw rude people. Then when we change, we see frightened people. They're so scared, poor things. They're driven to hostility. Then you're so understanding, you're so compassionate. Whereas before, you'd react with anger, with hate. Hey, wait a minute. Why is he being rude? You're too upset to see. You're too upset to realize. Could we clean you up? Oh, no, no, you've come to me so that I can prescribe medicine for the rest. And so, you see, my dears, we're all in the change business, aren't we? We want to change ourselves. We want to change the world. That's, our, that's what our stupid programming has done to us. We've got to change everything without first understanding anything. What you need is not change. You need understanding. Understand yourself. Understand others. I'm going to say something that's perfectly scandalous, but it's true. You're not here to change the world. You're here to love the world. And by damn, you don't want to love the world. You want to change it. You know what it means to love? What it means to love is to see, to see. You, how can you love what you don't even see? And how can you see when you're upset? How can you see when there's any strong emotion? Here comes another shock. Positive or negative coming in the way. They say love is blind. Rubbish! There's nothing so clear-sighted as love. The most clear-sighted thing in the world. Attachment is blind because it's stupid, because it's based on a false belief. And they call that love. I'm in love with you. I love you. What? You love me or you love yourself? You know what in love means? In love means I want you for me. In love, I am in love means I'm possessive of you. To be in love with you means, I want you for me, I'm not going to be happy without you, I emotionally depend on you, I can't be happy without you. That's a drug, that's a disease. Your culture and mine tells us it's the supreme virtue. It's garbage. But who dares to say this? You're blind. You're full of yourself when you're in love. Ever thought of that? You don't see the other person. You've projected a hopeful image onto that person and that's what you're loving. Hopeful. When we're not expecting anything from the other person, we don't say we're in love. Ma, you've got lots to meditate on. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm giving you too much. But anyway, there it goes. Relations. You're having trouble relating with others, take a look at yourself. Ask yourself why you are upset. Where is it coming from? You're programming, that's where. I've sometimes been amazed in the past that people who would irritate me by their behavior don't seem to irritate others who are far, far better than I am. I mean, how come he doesn't get irritated when exposed to this behavior? How come I do? There's something wrong with me. And here I was busy trying to change her or him or them. Now when I'm not upset, oh, then that's fine. That's fine. Then I might suggest things, I might do things. Now I'm qualified to enter into the change, uh, to, into any activity involving change. But not till then. Not till then.
my telescope is out of focus. Oh, there's a great secret for human relations. Uh, how much it has helped me. How much it has helped me. Anytime I'm having trouble with anyone, if I'm upset to say, hey, Tony, there's something wrong with you. How about you and I sit down and take a good look at it, okay? Okay, but I'm still dying to say, oh, no, no, you're upset, right? This isn't coming from him, not coming from you, coming from your programming. Oh, wow, well, I see. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, there's perspective, there's distance, there's understanding, there's love at last. And oh, I could be quite hard. You can be quite hard. Love can be quite hard. But love is fair. Love is just. Love sees. Love is not prejudiced. Okay, so much for human relations. A word about control. A big lie that we were told when we were kids is the following. You need to be loved. Well, when you're a kid, yes, granted, okay? Let's not quarrel about that. But you mean you're 64 years old and you're still a kid? You're 25 years old and you're still a kid? You're 18 years old, you're still a kid? And you know what they're telling you? You need to be loved. You need to be a success. You need to be approved. You need to be appreciated. You need to be affirmed. You need rubbish. And everybody's believing this. <laughs> I'll tell you what you need. There's only one need, and believe me, this is coming. Well, all right, you could say I'm wrong. Fine. This comes from many years, many years of lots of reflection. There's only one need. There's only one emotional need, and that is to love. To love. No other. No other. You mean I don't need to be loved? Wait a minute. May I know what you're talking about when you say to be loved? Are you talking of to be desired? I'm going to pause here. Is that what you're talking about? You need to be desired? That's what everybody's talking about. No one seems to desire me. You want to be desired? And you want all the consequences of that? With all the control and the manipulation, etc.? Is that what you're talking about? You need to be appreciated. Good. Watch this one. I'm going to dramatize it for you. May bring a little more action into this. You know, I, I meet... It's, it's amazing. You know, once you begin to understand yourself, you begin to understand people, and sometimes it's amusing. You're thinking, here comes old so-and-so. Watch how I'm going to make him happy, okay? Hey, Tom, you look great this morning. My God, you look 20 years younger. Tom's so happy. <laughs> that was a great sermon you gave, you know. He's thrilled. You could twirl them round your little finger. Maybe you've done it. Huh? Huh? You could do anything with these human monkeys. Just tell them you like them and tell them something good about them. They're, A, they're thrilled. B, they love you. What they call love, of course. Monkey love. Huh? You know what that love is? Watch. You be good to me, I be good to you, okay? You give me what I want, I'll like you, okay? You don't give me what I, I want, I dislike you, okay? This is supposed to be love, if you please, huh? This is what I call a good bargain. You find this in the marketplace, on uh, Wall Street, huh? It's supposed to be love. And nobody's telling us this. Nobody's analyzing this for us, at least very few. I never heard anybody. Saying, hey, what you're calling love is a bargain. It's an exchange. It's a barter. It's a business deal. I'm reading books on marriage written by all kinds of religious people. They don't seem to have the slightest notion of this. You be nice to me, I'll be nice to you. You're not nice to me, you betray me, you're disloyal to me, you're unfaithful to me. Naturally, I'm angry with you and I'm upset. And everybody's saying, right, naturally. Naturally? You call that love? So, here comes the computer. Press the button. The red button. He goes up. Ooh, he's so happy. You praised him.
criticize him, press the blue button, criticize him, bang, he's on the floor. You like to be that way? You got books on psychology, you know, written by the most prestigious psychologists in the world telling you that that's the way to be. When they tell you you're okay, naturally, naturally you're supposed to feel great. And when they tell you you're not okay, naturally you're supposed to feel down. <laughs> what do you know? This is supposed to be human, natural. I call it being a machine. You know the way, uh, <laughs> I read a story the other day of a woman who says to her teenage son, she says, would you like a... What does Mary find in you? What does she like in you? He says, what Mary likes in me is A, that I'm handsome, B, that I'm intelligent, and C, that I'm great company. And uh, his mother says, and what do you like in Mary? He says, what I like in Mary is that she finds me A, intelligent, <laughs> B, hand... You know, quality number one that I like in you is that you like me. How's that now, huh? They're so stupid, believe me, if you just tell them you like them, they'll like you. That's how stupid they are. Computers, machines, mechanical reactions. Why don't you buy your newspaper somewhere else? Look how rude he is to you. Why should he decide where I buy my newspaper? Why should his behavior decide what I do with my life? Isn't that beautiful? But as for you, you must be like your heavenly Father, all loving and all compassionate, for he makes his sun to shine on good and bad alike. What do you know? And on saints, makes his rain to fall on saints and sinners alike. If you only greet those who greet you, you're a monkey like the rest. You're a computer and mechanical. If you only like those who like you, it was right there. How come we didn't find it out? <laughs> Remember what I told you this morning? It was staring me in the face and I hadn't seen it. Take a little child, uh, six months old, and inject uh, heroin, any drug, into the body of this child, okay? And you keep injecting the drug into this child, and after a while, the whole body of the child is craving for the drug. Craving, desperately for the drug. See, it hasn't been brought up on good, healthy nutrition. It's been brought up on the drug. And so when you deprive the child of the drug, the poor child goes through the agonies of death, the body of the child. Okay. Ready for a surprise? That's what happened to you and me, to all of us. They drugged us. When we were kids, they didn't bring us up on the healthy, wholesome nourishment of play and work and beauty and the, the pleasures of the senses. And as we grew older, the pleasures of the mind. Oh no, oh no. They gave us a taste for a drug called approval. A drug called success. A drug called making it to the top, achieving. Affirmation. Triumph. Victory. They gave us power, reputation, fame, prestige. They gave us this drug. And you know something? We began to feel good. It was kind of a giddy feeling. A great feeling when they were applauding us. And we started thinking, well, it was great to be famous. It was great to be successful. It was great to be made much of. It was great to be popular. Result, as we began to grow, they could control us any way they liked, you know. All you have to do is with, withhold the drug. Boy, if you haven't gone through this, I salute you. They don't approve of you. How uneasy you feel. How restless. They criticize you. Uh, they're not affirming you. Withdrawal symptoms. You're crawling back for reassurance. And your psychologists are writing books telling you, this is the way to be. <laughs> this is the way to be. 
more of the drug, more control. Now, you know, as a result of doing this, you've lost your ability to love. Because when you need someone, you cannot love that person. Do you know why? Because you can't see that person anymore. When a politician needs votes, he stops seeing people. When a business woman or a business man becomes crazy over money, they stop seeing people. When I want something out of you, I'm not seeing you. I want to get something out of you. And do you know, my dears, it's so bad that 24 hours of the day, consciously or unconsciously, we want something from the people around us. We want their approval. We dread their disapproval. We're scared they'll reject us. We're scared of what they think of us. How could you love people like this? when you're so dependent on them emotionally. Oh, we've got to depend on one another, they'll tell you grandly. Of course we've got to depend on one another. We de that's how society is built up. We share the labor, we share our charisms. That's marvelous. I have nothing against that kind of dependence. The evil is to depend on another for your happiness. To depend on another for learning, for technicians or technical skill, for food, that's fine, that's fine. For cooperation in the work, that's wonderful. To depend on another for your happiness, that's the evil. Now you cannot love. Give it a thought later, when you have time and leisure. Until you stop depending on others, till you die to the need for people. When you first get in touch with this, you know it's terrifying because you suddenly become alone. Not lonely, alone. It's a strange feeling. You suddenly understand what you've been all along, but you never saw it. And you suddenly realize how lovely it is to be alone, not to need others emotionally. And for the first time you understand that you can love people. You don't need to bribe them. You don't need to manipulate them. You don't need to impress them. You don't need to placate them. At last you can love. And for the first time in your life, you are incapable of loneliness. You cannot be lonely anymore. You know what loneliness means? It means a desperate need for people to the point that you're unhappy without people. Loneliness is not cured by human company. Loneliness is cured by contact with reality, by understanding that we don't need people. We don't need them. At last you can enjoy them because you don't need them. There's no tension. You know what it means to be with people and to have no tension? Because you don't give a damn whether they like you or they don't like you, what they think of you. You know what that means? Oh, what a freedom. What a joy. They could think what they want. They could say what they want. That's all right. You're not affected. You got the drug out of your system. And oh yes, you're still in the world, but you're no longer off it. They can't control you anymore. And all of a sudden, you have nowhere to rest your head. The foxes have holes, the birds of the air have their nests. But you're not resting your head anywhere, you don't need to. Because you don't cling anymore. That's when love begins. Well, I've given you so much to meditate on. It's quite a wrap up, huh? <laughs> Yes, I got carried away. I'll end with a little parable, and uh, which if I had to choose one of the thousands of stories I know, I would choose, well, I would call my favorite story. And we'll end with that. Too bad that I cannot get any more feedback from you and we cannot use calls, but well, there's a limit to everything. Hope to see some of you at least in the summer 
in the longer courses that I have, I have time to develop these a little more systematically and a little more calmly and stuff. Well, the parable. A group of tourists sitting in a bus. <coughs> They're passing through the most gorgeous countryside. The drapes are drawn in the bus. Nobody sees a thing. And what do you think the people inside are doing? They're fast asleep, some of them. And others are obsessed with who's the best dressed woman in the bus. Who's the guy who's sitting in the most respectable place in the bus? And they're quarreling about this. And so it goes on to journey's end. And none of them have seen anything of this gorgeous countryside. What do you think most people are spending their lives on? On impressing others, that's what. On making sure they're not criticized. On getting affirmation. I wonder how many human beings there are who 24 hours of the day, consciously or unconsciously, are not obsessed with this. I wonder. Very few. Consequence, result. Very few people live. Talk about the rediscovery of life. You'll never rediscover life till you understand this falsehood, which our culture, our society, I'm sorry to say to some extent, even many of the world religions are perpetrating. They are the enemies of life. And here comes the story. There was a lion who, was, who grew up in a flock of sheep and had no consciousness that he was a lion. What do you know? He, he didn't know he was a lion. And one day, you know, he would bleat like a sheep, he'd eat grass like a sheep. And One day they were wandering at the edge of a big jungle when a mighty big lion let out a roar and he leaped out of the forest and right into the middle of the flock. And all the sheep scattered and ran away. And imagine the surprise of the jungle lion when he saw this lion there among the sheep. So he gave chase. He got hold of him. And there was this lion cringing in front of the, the king of the jungle. And the lion said to him, What are you doing here? And the guy said, Sorry, have mercy on me. Don't eat me. Have mercy on me. But the, the king of the forest dragged him with him. Come on with me. And he took him to a, a lake. And he said, look. So the lion who thought he was a sheep looked. And for the first time, he saw his reflection. He saw his image. Then he looked at the other lion. And he looked in again. And he let out a mighty roar. He was never a sheep again. It took one minute. Well, my dears, maybe in the course of all my talking, one or other of you will have looked and seen through all this network of lies and conditionings and programmings that we've been subjected to and has had some inkling into who they are. Well, then this day will have been worthwhile. I certainly thank all of you for coming here. It really has been a joy to talk to you people. And maybe someday, somewhere, we'll meet again. Thank you. <laughs>